This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10 is the time. A very good morning indeed to you. I hope you had a splendid, splendid weekend. Aaron has been in touch already. Uh, He has the same surname as me, I notice, from his WhatsApp profile. Uh, And talk about great minds. We haven't just got the same surname. We've just had exactly the same thought. Guess what he wrote? He wrote Aaron here, just in case you were wondering who it was. Uh, I think that question is like asking people without a phone to phone in. That was precisely... We've been spending... We've spent too much time together, haven't we? Over the last few years. We start, we'll be finishing each other's sentences next. Or, or helping each other to food off each other's plate. I, I literally walked through the door and thought, I've, this is a mad topic for a radio phone. And you can't have a radio phone in about people who are too frightened to express their opinion. Or too cowled, that's the word. I don't like frightened. Or, or too fearful of being harassed. You literally, it's the one topic you can never do. Give me a ring if you're frightened of telling me what you think. Give, give me a ring if you can't tell me what you think. T- give me a ring to tell me what you think if you can't tell me what you think. And Aaron uh, either remembers me talking about or possibly was here at the time when there was a story in the newspaper about people who didn't have a phone. They had neither a landline nor a mobile phone. And I got halfway, God knows, the producer must have taken a day off or something. Because we normally discuss what we're going to do on the programme before we actually start talking, before the light comes on. Not always in enormous depth, I grant you. But I, I found myself halfway through the sentence of saying, give me a ring if you haven't got a phone. Because I wanted to know, how, how, what, what can it possibly be like to live in a world that relies so heavily upon telecommunications if you have no phone of your own. So I, I, I literally, I'm sitting here, not in this very chair, it was, it was long enough ago that we were in a different studio, but I, I, I framed the thought and began the phone in, dedicated exclusively to people who had no phone, the people who were exclusively, exclusively incapable of contributing to the programme were the ones that I was inviting to contribute to the programme. So there's also, of course, the... Um, uh, 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 constant barrage, uh, often involving a man whose name rhymes with barrage, the constant barrage of people telling you that you can't say what you really think anymore without being called this, that or the other. But they never shut up. The people that are constantly telling me they're not allowed to say what they think anymore never stop telling me. I wish they'd take a day off from telling me what they think or telling me that they're not allowed to tell me what they think without... Uh, ah, like absolutely extraordinary. We've opened up a slightly surreal strain already this morning. Simon says, as a teacher, I always ask absent students to raise their hand. Reminds me of that poem that we uh, talked about in the, um, uh, back in the day. Was it <laughs> One fine day in the middle of the night, two dead men got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, pulled out swords and shot each other. It's all down a slightly surreal avenue. When, when you say you're cowed, it doesn't mean that you, you don't want to be called a wombat. So, you know, you say something like, I don't believe that vaccines are real and people call you a wombat. You're not, you're not being cowed. Also, they never shut up either. So 75% of the population feel that they can't speak their mind. While 27% have changed their way of life, like employing security or moving jobs. Elements of this report that Dame Sarah Khan has published today are very, very important. That teacher in Batley who deployed a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad or or a picture of the Prophet Muhammad while doing a religious education class and did it for, uh, 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 you know, not provocative reasons. He was doing it for educational reasons. Not that that should particularly make much difference, but that's a story that really shames an entire society. The lad, by all reports, is still in hiding. So there's a man who has been cowed into... Uh, well, not even silence, because he did it. He wasn't cowed into not doing it, because he did it. But he has had his life absolutely turned upside down as a consequence. So, for example, when she recommends that protests be banned within 150 metres of schools, unless it's teachers on strike who are picketing their own school, as it were, then um, I, I think that's probably quite a good idea for a whole heap of reasons, not least the fact that having potentially violent protests outside schools helps absolutely nobody except potentially violent protesters. But looking into the the, the figure of 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind, I honestly feel that I inhabit a different language, a different universe, a, a different environment from the public that have responded to this survey. So uh, there are a variety of questions that we could begin with today. Um, I, I, I suppose... Most of well, actually, should we go all in on this? 
Should we, should we do it? I've, I've always got the voice of Stuart Lee in the back of my mind on mornings like this. When, when, when he says, you can't, you can't say what you think in this country. You can't say you're English anymore without getting arrested. Or variations on that brilliant line of his. You can't, you can't say what you want without being called a racist. Oh, well, tell me what you want. Oh, I hate all black people. Well, no, that means you're a racist, mate. So, so I mean, that's part of it. Right, it's eight minutes after ten. Pay attention, right? I, I think we might possibly have to... No, I, I don't know. No, let's not say that yet. What would you say, hand on heart, and I'm not necessarily asking what you think, okay? But hand on heart, in, in the United Kingdom today... It is the 25th of March, 2024. What do you think is the perfectly legal opinion? The perfectly legal opinion. So it can't be incitement to hatred or incitement to violence or um, a, a, a hate crime. It has to be a legal opinion. What do you think is a perfectly legal opinion? The single most susceptible to like the single the opinion the single opinion most likely people are most likely to be frightened of voicing and 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 i like the word frightened so it's a perfectly legal opinion that people people are frightened of saying out loud um i don't know where the out loud bit comes in i don't know what what public means in this space i presume that you would say things at home to your partner or, or to your best friend that you wouldn't necessarily say uh, through a loud hailer in the middle of Leicester Square. But the opinion that is the one that people in this country are most frightened of voicing. That's what I want you to ring and tell me. And it doesn't have to be your own opinion necessarily. It just has to be the one that you think people are most frightened of voicing in public. Okay. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need because I, I don't I genuinely don't understand this statistic it, it, people feel they can't speak their mind and yet I mean I partly probably perhaps because of the job that I do it is impossible to imagine a, a society in which there are more pungent opinions constantly vying for attention and for prominence uh, I, I will take texts. Actually, this might be one of those very, very rare mornings where texts will actually allow people to say things that they wouldn't necessarily want to have attached to the tone of their own voice. So, so or indeed WhatsApps on 03456060973. It's not, Paul. You're very rude. Paul says, it's the great radio phone in standby. Call in and tell me the words you can't say. No, I'm not doing that. I'm genuinely interested because I'm going to tell you what mine is. John's already been in touch to say he can't talk about his fear of Muslims, spelt with an N. So what on earth would you have against um, particularly finely woven linen, John? I, I don't know that you should be frightened of, of expressing that out loud, but it's more of a phobia, isn't it, really? It's like being terrified of buttons or clowns. You're, you're frightened of cloths that mums use and dads use to, to mop up mucus from their baby's face. But anyway, fear of Muslims is up there. <coughs> On a similar theme, Andy's not taking things terribly seriously. He says uh, uh, he, he's got, he, doesn't, he doesn't like custard. Someone asked me the other day if I had any eating. You know, what are they called? Dietary requirements. And I replied, I said, I'm, I'm not terribly fond of marzipan. And they thought I was being serious. I, I, I mean, it was a, a weak joke, I grant you, at the best of times. But when you get a reply saying, well, I've spoken to the organisers and they're confident that there's no marzipan on the, <laughs> on the menu. Anyway, we digress. Um, there'll be lots of people saying, I'll give you some examples already. Gender critical views. Trans isn't normal. Um, uh, I don't like foreigners, says Steve. Mate, I hear these things all the time. That's the problem. I, I, I appreciate you might... Not be it, but where are you when you can't say them? If you work in an academic environment, some of these things may get you into a little bit of bother. If it's something that's likely to intimidate or um, or, or, or or hurt a colleague, then it's the job of the employer to, to police it. Sometimes they do that a little bit uh, heavy-handedly. But the question of what is the single legal opinion that you are confident is the hardest to publicly espouse in this country so the trans 
gen- well, transgender people, certainly one of the topics that I find hardest to address, partly because the the vitriol that, that it excites from two camps is, I mean, pretty hideous. But, but, but it's not so much a, a fear on my part. It's more a, a sense of pointlessness, a sense of pointlessness explaining what you believe because people will tell you that you don't or they will scream in your face that you're wrong. Also, uh, it, it's an example of, a, of an issue that is impossible to uh, contribute to without causing enormous outrage and upset when, when you don't actually want to. I'm always happy to cause outrage and upset deliberately or, co- or consciously, but I don't like doing it unnecessarily. So to say, as I do occasionally, I may as well go in there early, but I don't want the whole conversation to be about this. I want it to be about loads of different issues that you believe people when they tell you that they've been born into the wrong body. And you also believe people when they tell you that they're frightened um, to have some people who were born male coming into their previously private spaces. I, I know that the statistics and the evidence is um, are constantly debated and deeply debatable, but if you can believe those two things at the same time, you can't contribute to that conversation without upsetting absolutely everybody, which I will have just done. The other one, one I would say at the moment, and this might be a very personal perspective, is probably expressing sympathy for, for, for people in Gaza. Genuinely just expressing sympathy, just saying, for example, I refuse to feel more sorry about a dead Palestinian child than I do about a dead Israeli child and vice versa. I, I, I see the deaths as equal, which is enough to get you accused of anti-Semitism, enough to get you accused of Jew hating, enough to get you accused of being a Hamas supporter, going on a march. Um, calling for peace in the Middle East is enough to get you called a hate marcher or a terrorist sympathiser, including, uh, certainly for the first comment, by uh, a former Home Secretary. Uh, Quite extraordinary. And they're the kind of people that are constantly telling us they can't say what they think. That's an odd one, isn't it? So the opinion that you think genuinely and sincerely is... The one that people in the UK in 2024 are most likely to be frightened of expressing in public. And I'll take anything you've got, all right? I I, I mean, I, I think we'll lean towards the serious, but there's probably room for a little bit of levity as well this hour. So it's 2024. 75% of the British public feel that they can't speak their mind. A statistic I find ridiculous, hand on heart, truly ridiculous. But what is the subject most likely to fit into the category of subjects the British public feel they cannot speak their mind on? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 20 minutes after 10. <clears throat> and and I, I wonder whether that 75% figure is nonsense. Because judging by what some of the things that you're telling me, um, it, it, it just means that occasionally you watch your mouth. So you can't talk about Brexit when you're having Sunday lunch with the in-laws. I don't think that's an example of feeling that you can't speak your mind. It's just like the old adage about not talking about politics or, or religion at the dinner table because you, you, you're bound to upset somebody. Um, I, I, the idea, I mean, the, the idea that um, you're actually frightened of saying things that I hear every single day on the programme, or certainly in my inbox, maybe that's part of it. Maybe, maybe, maybe idiot's corner. People are frightened of saying out loud what they'll say in a text because they know that they will sound like idiots or they know that someone else will call them an idiot. So anyway, the two questions are, number one, what is the thing that you think in Britain in 2024 people are most likely to be frightened of saying out loud? And number two, I should have thought of this sooner. What is the, um, when you've expressed an opinion and it's as if you've set off a firework. You can't quite believe that the, the scale and perhaps the fury, either the quantity or the quality of the response. I'll set that up a little better in a moment. But let's let's get some calls on the board. Matt's in Leeds. Matt, what would you like to say? So the one that I, I came under fire for was I, I discussed uh, trans women Whee! in, uh, in male sports. Straight in there, straight away. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I should keep a tally. So ding, 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 ding. Carry on then. Here we are talking about the thing you can't talk about. What happened? So, so I was just met with a lot of backlash from it. And I think the word transphobe was used at me where I felt I was coming from a very logical place, especially in some sports, you know, 
Uh, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, recently about uh, uh, Leah Thomas, a trans swimmer, competing in, in women's races and, you know, excelling in those races. And, and then it's, it's met with the debate of feminism and, you know, You're not, it, it's I, just I, a, I, around the house one. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you'll understand people are going to struggle to believe that you've been cowed into silence, Matt. Well, it is one of those things. Uh, because here you yeah, are. Yes. On national radio. <laughs> It's, it's something that I just wasn't expecting to receive the backlash that I actually received for. I guess right. that was that was the thing that surprised me most on it. It felt like I was coming from a rather logical place. I, I was using the UFC as an example. If I said someone like Brock Lesnar uh, was identifying as a female and was competing against women... And then moved over into women, female fighting. Into trans trans women just, should not be able to compete against biological women in professional sport. Exactly. That, that was the argument, which I think is logical, but you'd be, you'd be surprised about the, the controversy that that was met with. And well, it's something I, I, that, I, I can tell you, I, I'll tell you for nothing, I wouldn't, be, I, I wouldn't be surprised by it, mm. but... Um, but I don't know, and I don't want to labour the point, but you haven't been cowed into silence. There'll be an awful lot of people, I think, listening who mm. completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very hard case to make. You think of rugby and, and as you say, really hardcore contact sports without denying the reality of, mm. of, of, of transgender people one iota, although there's plenty of people that want to do that as well. Um, mm. it, it, you are not part of the 75%, but I guess the 75% aren't going to ring me, so it's unfair of me. <laughs> to attack you for clearly not being an example of the thing that we're trying to discuss today. But that's mm. on the list. I, I mean, I, I don't think it would be the hardest thing, the, the, the thing most likely to excite uh, an attack or the thing most likely to be fearful to say in public for the very simple reason that even in that specific context, even in the context of transgender people, um, I've heard much, much worse things said. And, and therefore, they would be more likely to be things that people would be wary of saying out, uh, out loud. 23 minutes after 10 is the time. Nikki in Kent says, please don't dismiss Brexit. I've been accused of many things in my life, <laughs> Nikki, but not, not taking Brexit seriously enough. Has not until now being one of them. Uh, I was just uh, uh, being told to hold your tongue while you're having lunch with your own in-laws. I've had some really bad abuse on social media about it and in public. I feel it's really scary and I do feel like I can't express my anti-Brexit opinions about it anymore. So please don't dismiss it. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure whether the tongue is in the cheek here. I don't feel I can say that James is making a bit of a mess of this morning's phone in. So, well, I completely disagree with that, but I respect to the, to the, to the end of time. You're right to make that point. Ken's in Leon C. Ken, what would you? What do you think is in 2024 the thing that a, a fellow Brit? Because obviously you're not going to be wary of saying it out loud. You're about to say it. The thing that a fellow Brit might be most wary of saying out loud. If, if you're in Labour Party circles, you can't say you're anti-Zionist because you'll be accused of being anti-Semitic. Well, I, I, I let just first of all, you need to explain the difference. Right. The right-wing people in the, the government, and I include Netanyahu, seem to want Israel to be from the river to the sea. That they're, taking, they're not stopping the settlers. The settlers are taking more and more and more of the Palestinian land, and they're pushing um, the Palestinians to be enclosed in smaller and smaller. There was an extraordinary you, report about this on the BBC you, last night. I don't know you if you saw it. You could call them ghettos. Yes, you could. I, 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 I don't think you heard what I said. There was an extraordinary yeah. report about precisely this on the BBC last night. I, I, I really would recommend that everybody watch it. It was, right. it was very chilling. So, so where is it that you wouldn't be able to say what you just said? Well, if you're a Labour Party MP, or if you're in a Labour Party meeting, yeah. without being told, don't say that, we, we're, we've, we've got rid of anti-Semitism. If you say you're anti-Zionist, then the media will come down on us. So, I could mean, you, you could say what you've just said without necessarily deploying the rather nuanced and complex term anti-Zionist, couldn't you? I, I, I don't know. I think. I think. I, I, think well, say, I don't think anything that you've just said is is debatable. Really, the the, the you know the the desire of certainly members of Netanyahu's cabinet to uh, uh, well, eradicate um, Gaza in its current form and and replace it or or see it become part of a Greater Israel. I've seen a map of Greater Israel with with a with a cabinet member standing next to it. So you can say all of that, and the settlers' story is absolutely irrefutable as you describe it. Some of the examples 
on the report I saw last night were, were chilling. So all of that you can say. You will be called anti-Semitic by somebody. The question is how seriously you take that criticism, I think, Ken. It, dep- it depends where you are. So if, if you're, if, you know, if, you, if you're in a... a, a has this happened to you? Has, person, has this happened to you? Um, no, because I, I, I haven't discussed it with people. So we can't be sure that it's true then, can we? I, I think some of the Labour MPs have been suspended for saying stuff. A- Andy McDonald's suspension would work in your in your support, but of course, he I think it's now been lifted. Yeah, and that's it. Um, but I think others, I think a large number of peop- MPs and people who want to be prospective candidates would find it hard to say I'm anti-Zionist because I just think the two have been conflated. Yes. I mean, I think I agree with what everything you're saying, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's hard to say. It. Are, are you saying I'm anything scared. more, are you saying anything more than you can't criticise Israel without, without being called anti-Semitic? Are we going, I don't know that we are saying anything more than that, really, are we? Oh, well, I don't think Israel has to, has, I mean, in Zionism, in that when it was set up, it was a homeland for the people. So, it would, so But that's the, the meaning of Zionism that I usually start from, is just the belief in the, 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 the right of the modern state of Israel to exist. But that's not the meaning you're talking about. I think it's come to, to, to mean today the, the right to go wherever they want in Palestine. Yes, or, or it's become a, a belief that Israel is entitled to do whatever it is. It, it, it wants to do in the in the context of <clears throat> self-defense and not not even specific self-defense in in the context perhaps of a excuse me i've got a frog in my throat uh in the context of the october the 7th terror attack response or, or retaliation but in the context of of securing the safety of the state forever uh, so i think you're using zionism in that sense which I, I i mean people will agree and disagree with but i think you're right i think that is one of the hardest opinions to express in in the Labour Party, partly as a consequence of the opinions that people were able to express far too freely under the last leader. But the treatment of Andy MacDonald was clearly pretty pretty shabby uh, uh, at worst, oversensitive at best. It's coming up to half past ten. So trans in Israel, Kel Surprise, trans, tra- transgender and anti-Semitism. Is there anything else, do you think? What, what, what else might appear on the list? Um, I, I'm getting sense some fairly standard racism. Pete in Stamford thinks that um, black people are responsible for... Uh, all crime or most crime and that they're more racist than white people uh, Pete in Stanford clearly doesn't really ever mix with anybody except Pete in Stanford and that's fine too but if you're only really talking to the walls then you can say whatever you want also saying I don't think you'll read this out is usually proof that you're kind of either not very thoughtful in your contemplations or you don't really mean them you're just trying to be obnoxious trying to be offensive the thing that someone believes that isn't a crime isn't susceptible in the vaguest sense to allegations of, of, of hate crime that you in Britain today believe people would be most unlikely to publicly voice. And, and I, I reserve the right to, to, to follow that question up with the question of why would you want to? Why would you want to? But, um, but we begin with the question of what is the view? The texts today are extraordinary and I, I can't keep up. So if, I don't know how you're text works but it mine is almost like a ticker tape i can just about if i was doing nothing else i could click on them and save a couple but i can't it moves far too quickly so here's one listen to yourself o'brien you've become a fully pledged anti-zionist it's sickening someone who's listened to exactly the same conversation that you've listened to and 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 there it is um and then hamlet says saying that you like pineapple on your pizza is likely to get you into some trouble it's a rather splendid exchange between football fans involving pineapple on pizza lately but it it also involves the honor of the late queen so i probably won't share the details with you thomas watts is here now with your headlines james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it is 25 minutes to 11. Uh, Jonathan suggests our country isn't that great. There is little to be proud of compared to others and some humility wouldn't go amiss. You po- possibly would be fine to saying that in public. Um, I, I, I guess I have a, a, a fairly ludicrous perspective on a story like this because almost everything I say or, or, or indeed post on Twitter um, whenever I express a strong opinion can can upset someone and because I do it and more publicly than you do I I get a very unrealistic reflection so what what on earth are you cross about um, with regard perhaps to some embroidery on a football shirt 
Uh, it, that, that can upset people on an incredible scale. So I guess if I didn't do this job, I might think, is it really worth getting called all the names under the sun because I'm laughing at people who are shouting at cotton? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, actually, I'm completely, I'm probably the least qualified person in the world to, to have this conversation, except insofar as the things that I would think twice about saying out loud, even though I do hold them to be true. And, and that, but again, that's as a consequence of the v scale of the response, the vituperative nature of the response. So I don't know how helpful that is either. Um, I'll, I'll rattle through some texts because they're brilliant today and I can, I'm barely going to touch the sides of them. Andrew says, saying that tax rises are necessary. Adam says, how about all religions are a load of made up fairy tales? Uh, I, I hear that all the time, to be honest with you. This is brilliant, actually, from, from Gary. L listen to this. I wonder if this is actually a lot closer to the reality of this story than we've previously acknowledged. Please don't say my name. Um, oh, crikey, I just said his name. But sorry, I didn't say your whole name. Uh, John. So this is from John. I, I'm not sure if this is what you mean. I worked for a big Premier League football club, but I didn't support them. I once made a comment about them not being great at the weekend to some colleagues and got pulled into the boss's office on Monday to have a chat about it. And in 2019, when I was tweeting a lot about the election, a fan rang up the main number, switchboard number, and complained about my tweets because I represent the club so now i don't say anything anymore that gives you an indication of how brave gary lineker is i suppose because working in the football world you you can of course encounter some very um pungent perspectives and, and putting up the temptation not to offer up any opinion about anything is huge both in in sport and in politics and and of course if you work for the bbc so um, a lot of people won't like, there you go, there's something that you might think twice about saying in public. Gary Lineker is one of the most valuable contributors to public discourse in this country, precisely because the positions that he shares are shared by millions, but they come under attack from right-wing media, which is usually the place complaining most loudly about not being able to say what they really think. Um, and this from Andrew, I don't know whether this is tongue-in-cheek or not, mate. I'd be very conscious of expressing any negative but honest opinions about people on benefits, families with too many kids, and overweight people. I've been shamed and hushed many times when speaking openly. Andrew, there's not, there's barely a media organisation in the land where you wouldn't be in a position of enormous prominence by being repeatedly and even ignorantly rude about people on benefits, families with lots of children, although I presume you don't mean Boris Johnson, and overweight people. Mm, ditto. So I, I just don't recognise that. If if you say things and people say, God, that's, I mean, you're a bit of a bit of a pleb aren't you or you say something and someone responds by saying god you're gross that's that's not you being cowed into silence that's two expressions of freedom of speech meeting each other head on you say something obnoxious about someone on benefits and somebody in response says something obnoxious about you there's no there's no victim or winner there and of course the the, the killer test and the thing that this program um absolutely hinges on is the question of why you think that Let's examine the justification. That, to me, is the thing that upsets people the most. The thing, let's examine the justification for why you think that. Let's just work out whether what you say is true. Or, even if it is true, whether it proves the point you think it proves. 10.39 is the time. On we go. Oh, I have to read this out from Kenny in Liverpool. He says, I bet you don't read this out, but I love your latest book. <laughs> That's pretty controversial, Kenny. Dave's in Southend. Dave, what have you got? Hello, James. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, religion. And I, and I say that as a blanket statement. Yes. Um, I used to follow the Christian religion uh, as a child, and then I became a firefighter, and I saw death on the roads, death in houses, and started to challenge the thought process. Well, if there's an om omnipotent God who's all-powerful, why yeah. does it allow children to die in fires? And I spoke to the, the priests, and they always come up came up with the God moves in mysterious ways. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to put... You'll have plenty of more time to speak, but bizarre coincidence, actually, uh, that Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, who, who lost a baby daughter in a, in a car crash when, when she was, I think, nine months old, is my guest on Full Disclosure this week. And we have exactly that conversation. And I promise you, just, just for reference, you might not care, but it, he, he, he provides a much more fascinating, thought-provoking, compelling and compassionate answer to the question that you've just posed and I've ever heard before in my life. So a quick heads up for yeah. that. That's just because no, it's, uh, it's very fresh in my mind at the moment. And he was, he is an extraordinary man, although he'd hate that because he's also really very, very modest. But but on we go. Yep. Thank you, James. Well, the, the point I was going to try and make is 150 years ago, the Christian religion in the Victorian age 
if a female showed her ankles, she was uh, she was a slut. She was a horrible person. We've now, through education following World War Two, educated our populace so they can challenge religion and go, actually, what difference does it make if she shows her ankles? Now, because we've had mass immigration and not through their... not not because it's their fault, but the amount of education they've been enabled to prior to coming here, they still believe 100% that the Quran, the um, God, the various other religions are true. So when you dare to challenge it, as you raised earlier with the cartoon, the religion rises up because it fears the populace or those that currently follow it may change their view. And I have... Um, as a firefighter, I, I attended the largest Muslim festival over in Hampshire yeah. as the fire warden. And, and I was sort of the lead fire officer, and I had subordinate um, fire officers who were, who were of the Muslim faith. And I was t- sp- speaking to them, and I'm a devout uh, atheist, and explaining to them, and what do you do? And one of them said, I'm a scientist. And when it was just me and him, he said, I don't believe, but I have to believe, because if I don't, I will lose my family, I will lose my friends. I will lose everything that I have because the religion, which is basically population control, as I see it, yeah. wants people to follow it because it makes money. I don't know if you're aware, but religion pays no tax. I, I, so it's a business. I, 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 well, it's got gets, charitable status, so nor do some of the Tufton no nor some of the Tufton Street think tanks. I, I, yeah. well, pay, they pay some tax, don't they? Or is it no tax no, at all? No, they pay no tax. They oh. are exempt. So if you were to set up a church in your house, you could That's then seek tempting. donations and pay no tax on That's that. That's quite tempting. What are you doing on Wednesday? <laughs> absolutely I'm you, you can be a high priest it. of Jimism <laughs> Jimism actually Jimism yeah. might already exist so what is it that you've just said that you think people would be wary of saying or, or well, is actually, it is it the fellow who well, is wary of, of uh, admitting his atheism because he lives in a very religious well if I go to speaker's corner yeah. on a Sunday yeah I am in fear of attack from certain religious followers who would then aggressively oppress me to stop me from raising actually what, you know, if yeah, but that's not that's it, speaker's corner. That's not seventy five percent of the public feel they can't speak their mind. That's like zero point zero zero one percent of the public who want to I, want to say I something. The they want to say something they know yeah. is very very provocative, and they want to be able to say it without the consequences that they currently expect. Absolutely, but if I say it, yeah. I'm accused of blasphemy. Which I'm bit? Accused of raising. Well, I'm just being blessed. You know, I'm a blasphemer. No, but which but bit also, would get you accused I'm of blasphemy? Exciting, well, the fact that there is no God. Yeah. How dare you say that? You can't say there isn't a God because if, if they acknowledge there is no God, their business and their income has ceased. No, I understand all the points you're saying, but I, I don't know that saying that, that I don't believe there is a God is quite as controversial as you think it is. Yeah. I mean, I've heard well, people say it on television and the radio. I mean, I, 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 but I, I also think it's where you say it, James. If you were to go outside some of the big mosques in London and stand there as they do, making you know praying and saying actually yeah. what you're praying for there is no god you would you would struggle to leave there alive well i don't think that's necessarily true <laughs> but i wouldn't i wouldn't urge you I, I mean saying that there is no god is is i would have thought relatively mild in the context of blasphemy i can think of things that you could say outside some of the the, the, the mosques that where over the years extremists have held the upper hand that would perhaps provoke Pretty unpleasant responses. And the school in Batley, of course, was an entirely innocuous act by that teacher that was responded to in a ridiculously extremist way. But I, I, I think, I don't know that, that your I mean, personal, I, I don't know that your specific example is quite as powerful yeah. uh, as... But I think as a positive, in 150 yeah. years' time, once everyone's received an education oh. and the ability to rationalise that we will be in a much better place. Oh, well, I hope you're right as well, but I, I've got a horrible feeling that pendulums swing in both... Well, I know that pendulums swing in both directions. Look at Roe versus Wade in America, Dave. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, you know, yeah. and, in fact, look at the rise of the religious right in America. Uh, uh, somehow, seeing Donald Trump, a, a serial adulterer, and uh, well, that's putting it mildly, um, a self-confessed sex offender, I mean, a truly disgusting man by any so-called Christian values has become a sort of um, 
hero of, of the of the Christian right, the evangelical right in America. So I'm not as optimistic as you are, although I would quite like to be. 10.45 is the time. I would stress, though, it's a bit early doors because it's not out till... We'll probably put it out on Thursday, actually, because it's Good Friday, isn't it, on Friday? But I, I, I sat down with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and I did not want to stand up again. I, I can't remember the last time I finished an hour-long interview with someone, which is a rare opportunity anyway in the UK media, and just thought, cracky, we've barely touched the signs. We should have done five of these things. It's the second time because he's been in the studio and taking calls, which I, I, and it didn't happen then. I, 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 but this was, it is, it's a, it's, I would go so far as to say it's a beautiful interview. And I, and I urge you to check it out at the end of this week. Dave, you take care, mate. I'll see you on Wednesday for the first uh, celebration of, the, of the, the launch of the new religion coming out of my house, Jimism. All welcome. Come one, come all. Entry fee, five grand. It's 10.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.50 is the time. So I, I've been wondering a bit lately about my rather treasured theory that division and othering is a crucial part of government, you know, particularly right-wing government. Well, I, what we in this country at this point in history would call right-wing. People like Stalin deployed similar tactics, but you need an enemy. It's sort of Orwell 101, isn't it? You need an enemy for the population to focus on so that they don't focus too much on you when you're in charge. And it occurred to me that the very successful attempts to demonise transgender people in, in this country are utterly disproportionate to the existence of transgender people. But the the, the moral panic, if you like, has, has served well. I mean, even... They even said it out loud, didn't they? What part? Can hang on. I just need to check something with the producer. What party is Thirty P Lee in this week? Do we know? Is it? Well, we're not. We're not quite sure. But Lee Anderson, who used to be in the Conservative Party, even said that they were going to have to fight an entire election on transgender issues because they had nothing. I mean, they can hardly fight it on their record in government, can they? So, so that serves a purpose. Ditto. Islam. I, I, I mean, September the 11th changed everything for Muslims. They, they went from being abused for their skin colour and routinely called the P word and that kind of thing uh, to being abused for the actions of people who claimed to be acting in, in their religion. A extraordinary change. A prof my, again, full disclosure with Saeed Avasi recently is fascinating on this subject and, and deeply, deeply poignant. And of course, she was a chairman of the party of which 30p Lee was briefly deputy chairman. So I, the, I, the thing I've been thinking about is whether or not it's true that it is something inflicted upon us by authority or whether actually there's something human about needing this. We need something to get... And if, if you're built in that way, you need something. So I can sit here and, and call you a bigot if you're a bit racist or a bit misogynistic or whatever it might be. But really, I, I, maybe I also need to have a whetstone on which to sharpen my blades. And, and happily... I'd live in a period of history where government politicians have been so awful that I can go after them like a rat up a drainpipe every day. Or Brexit has been such a stupid thing to do that I can attack the people who sold it to us every day. But maybe I'm just feeding the same appetite inside in a way that I think is more palatable than going after brown people or... Um, or, or, or religious people or people of any... I don't know. I, I'm just thinking out loud. But I do know that in this country in the, in the 16th century, being the wrong, wrong kind of Christian could get you burnt at the stake. I, I, an anonymous note to the Privy Council that you were plotting to poison the Queen. You could tell, reading a brilliant author at the moment called S.W. Perry, set very much in this, in this era. It's crime fiction. It's historical crime fiction. And that, a constant reminder that no, there's nothing new under the sun, which is why Dave's contribution, although it ended optimistically, I, I don't know, I think things can go backwards as well as forwards. But anyway, enough from me. Ian's in Burton on Trent. Ian, what, what is the thing you feel people might be most reluctant to publicly air? Well, you've just syncopated exactly what I was thinking. Go on. The monarchy. Oh. The monarchy. Really? I'm sick and... Oh, yeah. You, you're coming from the left-wing press. The monarchy is disgusting. You've got primogeniture laws yes. going on where seven million are on a waiting list. For God's sake. The waiting list for what? NHS waiting, treatment? Yeah, yeah, for the NHS. When my wife was saying, last week we had a report 25 minutes on Good Morning Britain about middle-aged woman. Diagnosed with cancer. Well, oh, there's no need. There's, 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 there's no, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make light of that 
in any case, in any I'm family of choice. any woman. Uh, so, well, you are in a way. I mean, I mean, uh, admittedly, most middle-aged women wouldn't get 25 minutes on Good Morning Britain, but it is, yes. it's, it's a sad and poor... That's, that's tail-wagging dog, though. That's because people are interested in it. And no, people, no, no, no. You, it you is. It's commercial that... television, Ian. It's, it's, it's a commercial decision. Oh, well, because you presume that people are interested. When is the last time people have been asked? Well, they're asked every day because there's a the switch. Monarchy. They're no, asked they're every not. day. They're asked every day. There's a switch on their televisions. Oh, right. Okay. Is that all we've got? Is there a channel for our democracy? No. So no. You you, we've got elections Canada, for democracy. We've got television switches for deciding what we do and don't want to watch on television. What, what are your thoughts as a democratist about primogeniture? My first do thought is I'm not, sure take... de- I'm not sure democratist is a word. All right, as a as a an advocate of democracy, then yes. What are you? What are your thoughts about primogeniture? You, what, you mean the firstborn inheriting yeah, yeah, an estate towards a bloodline, as, as opposed to the French model where they shared everything among all their children, and uh, as a consequence, don't have quite the same aristocratic framework that we have in this country. I, I mean, yeah. I, I think you can leave your money to whichever child you want. No, no, no. But I want an elected head of state. But that's I got nothing to do with primogeniture. Before. Sorry. That's got nothing really? to do... It's based on the bloodline. Oh, no, it's talk about a hereditary monarchy, I think, would be more helpful. All right, let's yeah. talk about a hereditary monarchy. Yeah, I think it's very it's silly. Based on the bloodline. I, I think it's very silly, but I think it's like trying to get the eggs out of a baked cake. And, 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 and I think that the abolition of it, in the, certainly in the short term, would probably cause more harm than good. And it would upset many, many, many yeah. more people than it would please. So if we had a referendum on it, would you be happy? Oh, of course I would. Yeah. At least the public could doff our caps. At least the public could be asked. See, I think, I think you'd lose by a country mile. Oh, I don't, I don't think so. Do you want me to tell you why you think that? Yeah. Because you went to a private school. Right. And you benefit from the elitism in our society. Yes. Do you want me to tell you why I think that? You do. Well, it's true. I did go to you a private do. school and you're, I do benefit. Part, I talk about part, it all the time. You're part of the organic state. That, that, that presumes that everybody else is happy with the organic state. No, I'm not. I just look at the polling on the royal family, mate. Let's not get carried away. And it's completely contrary to what you think it is. Really? Well, yes. Well, and let me tell you why, there. actually, Ian. Drawing upon the benefits of a classical education. Let, let, let me tell you yeah, why. Yeah. The, deference, the deference you refer to correctly and, and, and rightly describe as cap doffing is an incredibly intoxicating drug, mate. So loads <laughs> of people... Do you think the people lining the mall with their little nylon flags all went to schools like mine? <laughs> I think nationalism is a lot... Answer the question. I insist... I think- that you I answer the question. Do you think all the little old ladies knitting get well soon blankets for Kate at the moment? Do you think they all went to public school and they're no, all? I don't. Do you but think I they all benefit be... from elitism? No, I don't. Do you I think they're all be... on the right side of epic epic inequality? No, it's the opium of the masses. It's well, the there you go then. The so that's why you'd lose a referendum. Oh no 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 no! Oh yes 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 yes. You were a big advocate of the opium of the masses. So we can delude people into thinking that... No, I, no I'm not. I'm, 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 a, I'm a daily antidote okay. to the opiate of the masses, mate. I'm like anti-opiate. Do you want a republic, then? Uh, I think a republic is a much, much healthier way to order a society, yes. Well, come out and say it, then. Well, but I just told you, if you want to have a referendum well, on it, I'd probably vote against the monarchy, but we'd lose. <laughs> so... Are we? Are you happy with well, this? Mate, what is this? I'm, I'm the plumbing inquisitor. It's not the uh, Ian in Burton on Trent show. It's the James O'Brien experience. Right. I've, I've provided answers to your questions that you weren't expecting, and now you don't know what to do. No, no, I do know what to do. Go on, so then, do it. We, you're happy as Keir Starmer is with the top seven percent benefiting from the sovereign grants. Well, the the elite, what? the monarchy, that is, benefiting from seventy eight no, million I, a year I just think, on I, the basis of a bloodline. No, I've, I've just said I'm not, haven't I? Well, okay, so let's change our society. Well, this okay, but, 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 but if you want to do it democratically, you'd have to have a vote, Ian, and, and you'd lose it at the moment precisely because of the opiate of the masses that you so accurately describe. I think next time you're in, you should make some notes before dialing 0345 973 And, um, I, yeah, Patrick says, I don't, I don't even like the royal family, but this is just bizarre, James. And uh, on the subject of the royal family, I'm not going to be talking about Kate Middleton uh, illness, except to say it was a very dignified pronouncement. And quite a few of you, I don't think it's appropriate to congratulate me on correctly describing what was going on, um, it, it, even if it was quite rare in the British media to have joined the dots and really just calculated that she wanted to talk to her children before she went public with what was almost certainly a 
a difficult medical issue, but I, I think correctly we'll, we'll respect the privacy of that family from here on in. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I, 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 it's a good job we didn't think about that too much, that topic, because otherwise we never would have come on air with it. It sort of proved its own point, didn't it, in the course of the, the conversation. The, the, I, give me a ring and tell me the things you're not allowed to say in public. It didn't quite... I tried to dress it up. I tried sincerely to, to turn it into something a little bit more intellectual than that or a little bit less sort of give me a ring if you haven't got a phone type territory. But goodness me, the people who are adamant that they're not allowed to say what they think certainly, certainly struggle to stop telling you what they think, don't they, in a, in a public space. But I, we, we will return to similar territory, no doubt. And there are some much more serious elements of Sarah Khan's um, report that merit a little bit more attention. Uh, a quick mention to Luke in Kenilworth, who submitted probably my two favourite WhatsApps of the day. And now that you can do it on WhatsApp, I can see who they're from, as opposed to just a bunch of numbers across the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, and I know, James, you've made this joke as well. It's just dropped as well, but Luke did it first. Is it, is the... It's the James O'Brien experience, like the Willy Wonka experience in Glasgow. Yeah, it is, actually. Uh, but he also sent in this one. James, I quite like the playful England flag update. Please keep me anonymous. <laughs> I, 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 oh, dear. I don't know quite. Where would that put you on the on the sort of under attack on social media thing to, to come out laughing at the people who were shouting at fla flags on, on Friday? I don't know. I don't know. But we move on, as we must. Four minutes after 11 is the time. I, I, a wise man once said to me that your house is worth one house. And this was when I was going through the phase that many people lucky enough to get on the property ladder go through, or certainly 20 years ago, um, marvelling at the speed with which your home was going up in value. Uh, the, you know, the, the years in which many people saw their home increase in value by a greater amount of money than they would earn in a year. It was extraordinary, and it felt like a massive win. And I was, I, you know, I even remember where I was. I was at a Christmas drinks party quite soon after moving into our last house. And the neighbour who actually went on to be a proper friend, the neighbour who I still see despite having moved house, um, he, it was him that said it, because one bloke there was giving it the whole, oh, it's gone up by this, that, and the other, and, you know, when I, I yada, yada, bing, bing. And, and look, I'm not being um, too judgy. The... Uh, it, but conversation was very commonplace at the time. It was one of the most, probably still is, one of the most popular topics of conversation among middle-class people who didn't know, well, among homeowners even, who just didn't know each other very well and lived in a similar area. Talking about property prices was de rigueur. Um, and, and my mate just said to me, well, of course, what you've got to remember, said to the other fellow, the fellow who was giving it large on the uh, amount by which all our houses had gone up, because we all lived on the same... I, I say estate, it doesn't quite conjure up the right image, but we all lived on the same couple of blocks, the same area, and all the houses were identical, you know, like those Victorian semis or Victorian terraces. They're nice size houses, but they're all identical. And, and so everyone in the conversation was essentially experiencing the same inflation of property. And my friend just said to the other fellow, he said, do you know what it's worth? And he went, yes, I do, I got hundreds of thousands of pounds. He said, no, it's worth one house. He goes, because... All you'll get for it when you sell it is what it's currently worth. And the next house you buy will also be worth what that house is worth. So you never really, until you, until you downsize or emigrate, th this money is meaningless. This money is never something that you will ever really be able to enjoy the fruits of because your house is worth one house. So you can go and live in a much, much smaller house in a much cheaper part of town and you, you benefit from the property increase that your house has currently enjoyed or, or you can move house and buy something else which has inflated similarly in recent years. There's some tiny little wiggle room on particularly nice areas. Brentford, for example, was in the Times on Saturday as one of the top 20 places to live in Britain at the moment. I, I just mentioned that, apropos nothing in particular. And, and of course, if you die, then your children inherit your house and, the, uh, and, what it, that, and that makes a difference. But if they're waiting for you to die in order to get on the property ladder themselves, then the property they can get access to albeit that it's an access that's afforded by their inheritance, is still going to be a victim of the same inflation that has delivered the payout or the size of the payout that they receive. So I, I've always thought that that was very um, helpful advice. It, I mean, I don't think I've ever had a conversation or I've ever contributed to a conversation about rocketing house prices since because it just sucked all the fun out of it on a sort of more negative side. It just made the conversation a little bit pointless. Your house 
is worth one house. <sighs> Except when you compare it internationally. It occurred to me this morning, looking at some rather splendid research by the Resolution Foundation, which I've never really done before, except, you know, looking in estate agent windows when you're on holiday and thinking, crikey. Or, or when you read those stories about people selling a Victorian terrace in West London and buying a chateau in Normandy, and you sort of crikey. But of course, I couldn't, I mean, would they let me build a studio? I could have the studio at the top of a tower in a Normandy chateau, but I, the show would suffer. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, get in the bus... Knocking around in town, being out and about, because I wouldn't see Keith's ugly mug every day. The um, actually, can you get me some French estate agents on the phone, please? Uh, so the, the idea that you 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 know you can free up all the cash you've made from your property is probably undergoing quite a serious transformation at the moment in the context of working from home. Something I've been meaning to talk about for a while, but it's not what we're talking about today. When you compare the UK to other countries, it turns out that we are living in more cramped conditions, even than people in one of the most built-up spaces on the planet, New York City, who aren't even in houses, they're in flats. So a house here is likely to have less floor space than a flat, or as they call them, an apartment, in America. We're also paying more for property while getting less in return. I'm less bothered about that because most of us aren't going to be making comparisons with foreign properties or, or moving overseas. But I am interested in the consequences of living in cramped conditions. We have the worst value for money housing of any advanced economy, which is the perfect c c counter, really, isn't it, to all of those conversations about how lucky we are because our properties are going up exponentially every year. That, that's the proof. So on the one hand, you've got my old mate saying, your house is worth one house, which sucks all the fun out of your, oh, look how much it's gone up since we bought it, darling, conversations. And on the other hand... Our housing is actually the worst value for money of any advanced economy. Somewhere between those two points is an incredibly clever observation about the nature of property ownership in Britain in 2024. But I'm not the man to make it. I can't quite pin it down. Somewhere between those two observations, your house is worth one house, and the UK has the worst value for money. Property in the UK is the worst value for money of any advanced economy, somewhere between those two positions is an observation of extraordinary perspicacity. But I'm not quite sure what it is. I could just stop talking now, open up the phone lines and invite you to make an observation of extraordinary perspicacity based upon those two central premises. The first, your house is worth one house. The second, property in Britain, British housing is the worst value for money of any advanced economy. But today's not the day for... Um, extraordinary perspicacity, necessarily, although the invitation stands. It, 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 tell me what this means. What does this mean? Because it means you're buying a house and it's worth an absolute fortune by any measure, even though it's only worth one house. But what you're actually getting isn't all that. So the international comparisons are possibly a little bit more interesting than I allow. But what I want to talk about first is the reality of living in cramped conditions. Uh, I would have to go back to my student days to remember living in cramped conditions, by which I mean space divided by people. So when we first got married, we lived in a small flat, but there were only the two of us. And if we tried to raise our family in that flat... I think our family would be quite different from how it is now. The relationships would be different. You wouldn't be able to take yourself off for a, for a, for a rest. Like my daughters like to spend time reading and doing things. And so I hope this isn't a... Uh, what's the um, word that I'm looking for? I hope, I hope this isn't... Patronising is not quite... Elitist. Elitist! That lad in Liverpool's given me... In Burton-on-Trent's given me a complex about being elitist. I hope this isn't elitist, but for people who've never lived in cramped conditions, people who've got a family home that isn't big enough, and this is going to include homeowners. This isn't a conversation about poverty. This is people living in properties worth three, four, five hundred thousand pounds, depending on where you are in the country. This is a conversation about... Having an expensive home, in terms of what you earn, what your home is worth, is a lot of money. Or, or rent, it doesn't matter which. You're paying a lot of money to live there, but it's not actually fit for purpose. Whether you own it or rent it, it's too small for what you want. 
What's that like? Can you explain to someone who's been lucky enough not to feel that they are living in cramped conditions what it's like to live in cramped conditions? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. Or, in which case, this will be the second hour of the program where I've set up a phone-in that isn't really a phone-in. Or, if that's all you've ever known, how, how do you know it's cramped? I guess... If you've got children sharing bedrooms, that's suboptimal, isn't it? But it was commonplace for some of us when I was growing up. I shared a bedroom with my sister for a long time, but not after we were 10, 11, 12 years old. So what, 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 what is the impact of cramped conditions in, in housing? How, just to just describe the impact it has on your mental health or your general sense of well-being. They are smaller by floor space they're also older than any other european country so house building in this country is a, is a national catastrophe for a whole heap of reasons but i want to zone in if i can first and foremost on space you haven't got enough space just tell me what that's like and it, it, it it's not in any way a disqualifying factor if you're living somewhere that is not particularly um luscious but but if it is an expensive place you're living in and now that you step back and think about it, or when you go and visit friends abroad or, or possibly outside big cities even, you can't believe how little space you've got for your money. I want to know what that's like. I want to know about the, the relationship between space and happiness. 03456060973. And if this doesn't work, we will have a conversation about value and that curious combination of your house being worth one house, but your British house being the worst value for money of any advanced economy. Actually, we'll do both, but I really want you to try, if you can, first, to look at the relationship between space and happiness. One of the biggest lessons I learned when I started knocking, out, knocking about with posh people was when they would talk about going to the country for the weekend. And I didn't know I didn't know what they were talking about. This didn't happen at school, because uh, uh, even though there were plenty of posh people at my school, we all went home at, uh, at, at Exiat. But, but when I came to London, and my, my, so, my social circle was very, very mixed, and it included people who have moats around their houses, and they would talk about going to the country for the weekend. And I didn't know, I, I mean, I, I, I may even on occasion have said which country. What, what, what do you mean you're going to the country for the weekend? But what, they, what wealthy people have done for time immemorial is quit the city on Friday afternoon and go to the, what we would call the countryside. That's what they mean by the country. Posh people often have like, secret codes and languages to make the rest of us feel like plebs. It's quite deliberate. Um, it's why they, words like Beauchamp pronounced Beecham and the, the spellings bear no resemblance whatsoever to pronunciations. But they say we're going to the country for the weekend. And I'd say, what, 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 what do you mean you're going to? And it just meant they were going to a country home. Some, one of them had a country home as well as a city home. And when I started getting invited to do that, I completely understood the importance of space. Even if you were living in a little flat in a smart part of town, getting out every Friday into, into, into space. Not, I don't mean the countryside. I mean big homes, big buildings where you had a lot of space, where you could sit in a corner reading, undisturbed. I, ju I just, I don't know if that's relevant or not, but give me a call if you can tell me about the relationship between, what's it like to live in cramped conditions? I know what you're thinking. How the hell did it take you 14 minutes to ask that question? What's it like to live in cramped conditions? Because it seems to me to be a peculiarly British malaise. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. Or by all means, chip in on the on the uh, observations of extraordinary perspicacity as well, if you are so minded. It's 1117. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is a British malaise, James. You just have to check room for rent ads. A double large room, 1,200 quid, and you can barely fit a chair in it once you've got a double bed. Cosy room means a matchbox. Any European countries will charge rent based on quality. Um, my Spanish living room is twice the size of my Hounslow studio. Uh, so let's do the why of it as well. So what's it like to live in cramped conditions? And why is British housing the worst in the world? in context of both space and, I think, as a consequence of that, value for money. Why? What's the historical rational, rationale, reasoning, explanation for this? Hit the numbers now. 
but you know the rest. KJ's in Wanstead. KJ, what, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Um, I think because I come from New Zealand, grew up in New Zealand, moved to the UK um, to do my OE in my early 20s. Oh, yeah. Um, to do your and, what? Um, yep. To do what? O- o- OA? <laughs> to do my OE. OE. What's that? Um, I think it, it stands for like overseas advent, uh, overseas sort of experience. Oh, I think. sorry, I thought it was like a, I thought it was like an academic qualification that you just presumed I knew, and <laughs> no. I thought was she on a, so I pretended I knew for a minute, and then I thought no, I can't pretend I know in case it comes up later in the conversation. So you just you just came yeah. on 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 your gap year, as posh people in England yes, call it. Pretty yes, much. carry on. Yeah. Um, met my husband, got married, um, and when I lived in New Zealand, lived in a big, you know, five bedroom house. Yes. Um, lots and lots of space. You know, we had sort of twelve acres, and um, now we live in London. Um, we live in a two bedroom flat. Yeah. And there are five of us. I've got three teenage kids, and um, my husband and myself. Crikey, that is tight. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how does that? How, how does that? If I, if I may inquire, what are the sleeping arrangements? Um, my son has his own room. He has the small room. Yeah. The girls share the big room, and my husband and I have the most amazing fold-out sofa in the lounge that we sleep on. Crikey. How old are the kids? Yeah. Teenage, you said. So, they, uh, so they're just getting yeah. to the point. What's going to happen when they get to the point where they want to stay up late? You're just going to send them to their rooms, and you want to go to sleep. Well, you no, may have they, reached it already. Yeah, they do already. They're uh, 17, 16, and 13. But the girls tend to spend a lot of time in their room. Yeah. Um, although, actually, they do spend a lot of time in the living room with us as well. Um, but, you know, sort of come around. At, at the moment, my girls are both studying for exams. We've got GCSEs and A-levels. Same. My oldest daughter spends a lot of time at the library. Um, yeah. And, yeah, my, my younger daughter, she tends to study in a room. So what do you think the difference is, then, between your teenage years and their teenage years? And it may not be. You may not think it's bigger. I'm just sitting here having had only experience of of having quite a lot of room. I, I, I don't have the comparison to make, but no one's going to be better qualified to make it than you are because they're the age that you were when you were living yeah. in, in loads and loads of space, acres of gold. Yeah. They, um, they, they bicker a lot, but I think mm. that's pretty normal, talking to friends who have a lot of space. Um, but they, um, my middle one, I think, suffers the most. She always complains of not having her own bedroom and her right. own space. Yeah. And I think they do find it difficult, but we're all kind of in the same boat, except for my son, who has his own space. Yes. Um, he's the only one, really, that does. But, um, does that I mean, cause, re- does that cause resentment? Um, not really, no. Because no one would want to share with him anyway. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And my husband comes from a part of the world where, um, you know, he grew up in a in a small cramped flat with, okay. you know, way more kids than we've got. So for him, it's completely normal. And it's taken me a lot of time to get used to it. The only reason I think, or the main reason we're still in our flat is because we live in a wonderful place where we've got a really great sense of community. When the kids were little, yeah. it was like for me growing up in New Zealand, they could go outside and play. Um, we've got big communal gardens and, you know, I could let the kids out to play. My flat doesn't overlook the gardens, but sure. because we've lived here for so long, Long, the people who had kids who I knew, um, their flats did overlook the garden. So there was always somebody who could sort of see them and hear them. And so they had that sort of sense of, of being able to go out and play and have a little bit of freedom. Um, so there's even, advantages, even advantages to it. I like that. And have you had family yeah. visit from New Zealand? Yep. What, what and do they think? When my mum comes, yeah. we squeeze her in. But what does she think about it? What does she, I mean, it must be quite odd for her. It is. It's very odd for her, but um, I think she likes the sense that um, I don't know. She just she she sleeps on my son's bottom bunk when she comes to stay, Gosh. so he has to share a room with Nana, and yeah. she really likes being so close to the kids. Yeah, um, you can't get much yeah. closer. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so no. So it's not something that keeps you awake at night. Then that'll be the kids. It's not something that you. You. I mean, obviously, you'd rather live with a little bit more space, but it's not. A, it's not like yeah. a constant nagging pressure um no every sort of six to eight months or so it is it, it, okay, it really it gets me down again. got you so yeah it, it does but um the alternative would be moving somewhere bigger paying a lot more in rent and then not being able to travel to see family because neither my husband or i have family in the uk yeah so holidays are spent 
going to visit family. Yeah, so that's, that's really where the sort of extra money goes. I love it. I, 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 that's fascinating. Thank you. I, I can't. I don't imagine anyone will be better qualified to compare the two. But yeah, I, I mean, bickering space. Also, some of it isn't easy to articulate, is it? Just that notion f- of being able to hide from your family. I, it's very, very hard to do. Impossible in a way for your daughters. But how often do you really feel like that? 26 minutes after 11 is the time. Why has the UK ended up like this? You can see why it would be different from New Zealand for, for fairly obvious reasons. But why would we be different from Germany or France? What, what has happened? What's the history? How much blame lies with house builders or politicians or history or dumb luck? Why, why have we ended up in a place where our property is the worst value essentially in the world? 0345 6060 Lillian's in Forest Hill. Lillian, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Hello. Um, yeah, yeah uh, I just... Um, my situation is that we... Um, my husband and I bought a, a shared ownership yeah. property um, quite a few years ago now when I was pregnant with my eldest. Right. I suppose at the time it was only a small flat of two bedrooms and um, kind of studio, you know, with the kitchen yeah. and the living room combined. And I suppose at the time we thought, you know, we'll have our kids and then we'll be able to kind of move on and, you know, I'll go back to work and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. Life, you know, life throws your curveball. Um, both my kids were diagnosed as um, uh, autistic when they were little, and so obviously it's not been a simple um, going pathway. back to work. You know, I've never doesn't been mean, able. Yeah, yeah I was sure. never able to work full time. I managed to work kind of part time because I've got you know I work for the NHS. It's possible, but. I've never been able to kind of go back full time or 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 work at the level that I was before, and mm. um, so you're in the same so, place. Yeah, so we're basically stuck in a in a two bedroom um, flat, and my my sons are um, now teenagers, and um, they just their their sensory needs as autistic kids totally, you know, clash. Right with of each course. other yes so they they can't share a room so they get a room now. each and you're sleeping in uh, the sitting room so yes basically Crikey. and and it is you know it, it it's very um it is very difficult you know there's two families on the trot there in in different yeah, but similar yeah. circumstances and you know usually yeah. my, my i know this isn't science my switchboard <laughs> but that means that this is a much bigger yeah. reality that yeah. most pe- most of us not in it probably realise. It's, it's also, I presume, yeah. Lillian, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's not something you drop into conversation casually with new acquaintances that you keep in the living room. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. And I think it's true. And I think, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, it affects us all, really, because, yeah. you know, we've become quite an insular family, I think, ah, not yes. just because of, obviously, the kids' needs, but also because... You don't feel like you can invite people yeah, around yeah, very much because yeah. there's just not very much space, and their their bedrooms are small, and you know they they even though they they get their own rooms pretty much. My husband still has to, you know, he works from home sometimes. Good he, lord, he still has to work in one of the bedrooms yeah. because my other son has to be taught at home at the moment. So. Right. It's um yeah it's it, it's difficult you know when none of us really get any any space from each other I think the kids and and what know. KJ said about I mean because we all live with what we live with but every now yeah. and then you you you, you notice that it's suboptimal. So she said every six to eight months you, you get so do you get that do you get a sort of occasional overwhelming desire to have more space? Um yeah well yeah all the time all the time, all the time, is time it? right to be honest. yes. Um, and it's, you know, and it's things like as well, you know, the kids obviously, um, they're quite noisy, you know, they can be quite noisy, um, for one reason or another. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, it's, it's it. that, it's having neighbours close by and, and yeah, it does, it does really affect your, um, mental health, um, you know, and and, and, and it's on the out. list. It's on the list of things that you can't do anything about. Of course, with uh, th- thank you, Lily. And I'm I'm moving on only because we're a little bit late for the news. I, I hope you feel you had the chance to have a, have a proper say. I certainly do. I, and and there it is. So the topic's shifted slightly, hasn't it? And into what what's it like not to have a bedroom? 
So as a child, what's it like to have to... So what's it like not to have your own room, even if you're sharing it? So that shows my privilege, my very middle-class privilege, talking about have, sharing with my sister when we were kids. But we actually had a spare room. <laughs> in that house for when other people came to visit it was uh, older relatives were still alive so my auntie my great aunt and granddad Pete, lots of people would come and visit so we had a spare room but talking about people talking about when the parents haven't got a bedroom now listen two swallows does not a summer make but trust me the way my switchboard works and the way my inbox is 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 um operating today that that is not as extraordinary as i would have thought at 11 o'clock this morning Mum and dad haven't got a bedroom, or, or, or mum or dad, if it's a single parent family. The, the parents don't have their own room. 03456060973 is the number you need. And, and great thanks, of course, to Peter for reminding us. We're not supposed to be talking about this today. We're supposed to be feeling sorry for people in Surrey struggling to get by on 100 grand a year. 32 after 11 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. So now the why of it, we've done the what of it, but if it is relatively commonplace for families to be living in homes where not everyone has a bedroom, and I don't mean kids sharing, which was relatively normal back in the day, but I mean parents sleeping in the sitting room on a, on a pull-out sofa, then how have we ended up in this situation when other comparative economies haven't? And to make things even madder, and this is where it gets really bonkers, if you were to move to a, a, an, another advanced economy, you would not only have a lot more room, you would be paying less for it. So we've ended up with the worst of all imaginable worlds. We've got the least amount of room and the highest. I don't think that the madness of thinking that your property going up in value at a rate of knots must be an unalloyed good thing has ever been clearer. It's obviously a bad thing. What would you rather have? A property that wasn't going up in value but was twice the size of the one you've currently got? I don't know what the relationship is. Listen to this, though, from Emma. I think the British culture is operating under the feudalistic idea that the land we're born on doesn't actually belong to us. It belongs to kings or landlords or employers. It's quite tragic when you think about it. We've had our connection to our land severed by love of profit. I'd imagine that other cultures are quite different. A difference in their fundamental relationship with the world. And I, 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 is, there, is, it, is it aristocracy again? Maybe our caller in Burton-on-Trent talking about primogeniture and hereditary monarchy should have stayed on for a little bit longer. We could have moved into this conversation and explained how actually the reason why you're sleeping on a pull-out sofa in the sitting room is, is because so much of the property is owned by such a small amount, such a small number of people. Um, I, 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 I just find that fascinating. There's another theory as well. Um, which you've shared with me, and it is perhaps inevitably traceable back to Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I'm told by Nan of Stan that we don't have minimum space standards in the UK. In Europe, elsewhere in Europe, you'll have regulation and enforcement. Isn't it odd how the sort of ghost, the spectre of the haunted penny farthing himself, Jacob Rees-Mogg, crops up whenever you see the phrase Europe and regulation in the same sentence. So here's another example of something that could be described as EU regulation, minimum space standards. So developers cannot squeeze even more money out of you when you buy a property without giving you more space in return. Oh, no, we must get rid of that sort of thing, says a man who probably has a moat around his house in Somerset. It's, it's, it's so, I mean, the deference involved in letting people like that tell you to surrender your regulations and then you cheering as they disappear over the horizon is quite extraordinary. We had something I read called Parker Morris standards from the 60s to the 80s when Thatcher dropped them to encourage large scale developments on smaller plots out of town. How big a part of the problem is that? And what is the problem like? We continue our conversation. John's in Edinburgh. John, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Really nice to chat to you, sir. Um, I, pretty similar to the callers um, you've been dealing with this morning, I, I, share, I have to sleep in the living room uh, with my partner right. in order for my two boys to have a room and my daughter to have a room. And it's very, very difficult. You know, we do struggle a lot with, you know, even... Uh, yeah. they, they, they just need to have time with each other yes. um, just to be a bit solitude by yourself none of that is really available because obviously um, the living room is actually access to the kitchen as well so if I go to my bed early which doesn't really happen but if I do then the kids are restricted to 
you know, getting a, a, a drink at night or some food at night, you know, it's very impacting on them too. So, but I also count myself very lucky, James. I could be in a lot worse situation, you know. Um, but yeah. I do struggle with it, bud. That's a funny one, isn't it? You could be in a much worse situation, but that's a bit like. You know, you know, if you've got a broken leg, thinking, well, at least I haven't got cancer. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's like, yeah. I'm like that. I'm built like that, but some people aren't. Some people are not yeah. built like that at all. That's how my mind works. Well, we had, um, just you mentioned that my mum was actually diagnosed with terminal cancer, so part of our memory building at the weekend just passed as we went up to Invergowery, my oh. sister and her family, okay. and me and my family, and it was a massive house we were in. You, well, you it borrowed really it. Nice you rented it. Did, did yeah. you? Sorry, sir, I missed that. Did you rent it? Yeah, yeah, we had it for a couple of nights, yeah, um, just to make some memories for mum. Oh. And the fact we had, you know, a room mm. each, there was a snug, oh. massive kitchen, you know, a lovely lounge. It just really kind of brought home a wee bit how it would be nice to have experiences like that on a regular basis. But as I said before, and I, I know your analogy, I, I could it could be a lot worse. No, I know but it could, but what would be better? What would be, I mean, you talked about having time and space to yourself. I, 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 th- I think... You know, I'm obsessed with hypervigilance, John, because it's, it's <laughs> something I learnt about in therapy. That, that, but that, that, there's levels of relaxation. If you think, yeah. think of relaxation as a dial, when is it at its lowest? Probably when I'm under a big sky on yeah. my own, yeah. you know, and, and the, the, then that, that would be zero. But you turn it up to one, two, three, it's when you're in a big room on your own or you've, you're sitting on a sofa, you've got quiet, you know that the door's not going to crash open in the next five minutes. Do you see what I mean? And, yeah, and definitely. So yeah, I'm yeah, living my life. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Really nice. So I'm living my life in a different place on the dial from you, permanently. Permanently different places on the dial. You might occasionally get it down to zero or one or two, but I can live at one or two or three. Yeah. And that's going to have a toll that we don't even notice, isn't it? Yeah, I do struggle sometimes with it, sir. I really I, well, do. I would as well. And next time you ring in, stop calling me sir. I will do. Makes okay. me feel like a prison officer. Look, <laughs> <laughs> look after yourself, John. Thank you for that, mate. Stay safe. Loads of messages coming in. And, and thank you for not being cross with me, for being surprised by the reality of your existence. I, 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 I would accept the criticism for being a bit blindsided by how many people sleep in, in communal areas, sitting sitting rooms um, on, on pull-out beds. So more on the why of it then. Parker, Parker Morris, not Parker Knoll, is it? The um, Thatcher removal of regulation. So as I understand it, a developer in this country can make more money by cramming in more home to the same area, whereas in another country, it would be fewer homes and the same space, so each home would be bigger. And the prop developers would still be incredibly profitable but not as profitable as they are here so you know we seem to be coming up against this again and again and again on the program tory governments giving already wealthy people an almost carte blanche to get ever richer at the expense of ordinary people mike's in marlow mike what would you like to say yeah good morning james i mean yeah the obvious one is the you know the developer greed if you like well Um, i mean needs explaining though doesn't it well, it does, yeah, but you put 10% extra into a site, that's 10% extra profit on the on the same outlay, you know? Uh, and it doesn't cross um, your mind that people are going to be living in circumstances. No, they don't care, do they? Because we don't you, care enough about people. Just there's another 50 problem. grand in it for you, mate. What are you going to yeah, do? Well, there you go. What are you going to do? Go. There yeah. you go. But also, houses like yours, I, I imagine you live in a Victorian house in west of London. Yeah. Um, oh, that's Victorian. split into four flats these days. Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah, there's yeah. always those ones. You've got all the post-war stuff, you know, where, where materials weren't available. So they just built houses smaller and smaller and smaller. So all the post-war stuff is tiny. Some parts um, of town, it started going back again, actually. At Not- yeah. Notting Hill, uh, some, some which, of course, famously got turned into flats in the 60s and the 70s. Quite a few people are now turning them back. Around. But that's your bankers. That's your people who've yeah. got, I mean, money coming mm-hmm. out of their ears. So... What, but that doesn't make us different from, say, a, a German city or a French city. What is it about London, well, for example? Buy. In Germany, they rent, don't They've they? They've got a lot of rent control. Just a completely yeah. different system. Yeah. Tracing yeah, yeah, it yeah. down to, uh, also, Emma's point about ownership. Leaseholds, yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but the, in Germany, it's a completely different system. There's no, you know, over here, we have to, you know, it's all bricks and mortar and, you know, all stoic and British and stiff upper lip and you know we must own our own home yeah. they don't care about that they just want somewhere to live if you could change one thing if i put you in charge tomorrow 
If you could change one thing to improve this, not overnight, but to start the process of improvement, what would it be? Think about the people you're building for. So then bring back minimum space regulations. Absolutely. In the first Think instance. about not building on floodplains. Think about not building along uh, the edge of a railway line. Think about not building on, on mm. you know, releasing some nice land because it's a nice place to live, not because it's profitable, because it's a dirty old And then site, they'd be queuing know? up at Downing Street to tell Rishi Sunak, we can't do that. We've got, I know we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't build any houses at all. I'd add another one to, to Mike's point as well, which is to ban the... This was political for a while. One of the parties came out with this, which would be... You, if you, you can't sit on huge sites that have already got their permissions in place but uh, you you're waiting for the market to change before you actually build on it if you if you own it you 12 months 24 months i don't know what would be realistic but if you haven't built it by then you've got to sell it or 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 surrender it to me i mean the government and then then so space regulations minimum space regulations i always remember seeing a story it was probably on the one show uh, or watchdog or the watchdog bit that matt does on the one show when you parked a car in a garage and you couldn't open the doors you had to climb out through the sunroof because the developers had <laughs> squeezed the margin so much. If you had a particularly wide car or just a slightly above average car, not necessarily a big four by four, but maybe an American. So you couldn't get, they couldn't open the car doors when you're in the garage because the walls. Were, so the human equivalent of that, you should have rules in place. Parker Morris, bring back Parker Morris. There's a campaign. Bring back Parker Morris. Um, and and replace oh someone's gone for a full manifesto and replace council tax with a land value tax and ban houses of multiple occupancy some people need houses of multiple occupancy david but otherwise the the parker morris stuff and the land value tax um seem probably to be steps in the right direction it's 11:47 james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc I, I, I probably shouldn't share so much about the inner workings of the show because it makes me sound a bit incompetent. Just to be clear, this is all on me. It has absolutely nothing to do with my crack team of, of uh, award-winning operatives. But I don't think we can do the Jeremy Hunt story after this hour, can we? You can't, I mean, you can't have a conversation about people sleeping on sofa beds in their sitting rooms so that the kids can have their own bedrooms. And the curious state of... I mean, I think he owns seven flats for a start, doesn't he? The Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he was opining at the weekend that it's quite hard sometimes to get by on 100 grand a year, which I was going to seek to defend <laughs> in the next hour of the programme. No, not like that. I just, just from the point of view that you... If you're on 100 grand a year, then the chances are that you're laying out roughly 99 grand a year on your normal life, you know, by the time you factored in what you normally do. So if something comes along like energy cost crisis, cost of living crisis, or a massive increase in your mortgage payments, then you've got a problem. And that's as true if you're on 10 grand a year, surviving on by spending 9,999, as if, if you're on 100 grand a year, surviving on 99,999. He's got 99 problems, Jeremy Hunt, but this ain't one. So I don't think it would work today. I think it would just sound weird to go from this conversation to that one. So nominations, please, for the next hour. I'm drawn to an imminent claim from the warning, even, from the head of the BBC about conspiracies. I keep coming across people who I didn't think would fall for weird conspiracies, people whose background, education, dare I say social class, probably not social class, shouldn't be relevant at all, background and education, and job mean that I would have previously presumed they'd be a million miles away from believing some of the madness that seems to have captured corners of the internet in recent years. So we may have a look at that next. But but we continue with the housing question for now. Oh, Steve Steve thinks we should do the hunt topic because it, it contrasts nicely with this. I was thinking more about my thoughts, actually, being a bit clumsy. in the, But I could change them, I suppose. Tom's in the lakes. Tom, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Tom. Um, I've... Um been a, a building contractor uh, all my life. I, I was a farmer's uh, farmer's son, oh, yeah. uh, so I suppose I've I've been entitled in a way. I've always been living in a big house, yes. lots of space. But the the line of work I went into, I saw what uh, a lot of the population live in and and their housing. And um, I would say it, it, a lot of the problem we have faced has been. Um, profit driven from developers but also um i've found my customers through no fault of their own yeah. when pricing jobs or looking at jobs and i always sold extensions and worked to the house as if if we do x y and z to your property we will add yes x amount of 
value onto it and I feel people have always um, th- there's always been a, a sweet spot in the money they'd spend on maybe opening up their house and putting an extension on to the value of it and people have always held back on creating space oh. even if they wanted it but because it didn't really stack up on the equity side oh so I thought you were going in the opposite direction which is why I was confused so so you're saying people could have made their homes bigger but they wouldn't actually increase the value by that much so they don't bother correct oh. that, 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 that's what I've found yeah uh, until very recently I would say after covid people are far more focused on maybe the, the their quality of living or space rather than being worried about the value it's adding onto their, onto their home. Obviously, this is homeowners who are in a position to, to pay for that sort of work. So really, I mean, home improvements is the wrong phrase, isn't it? It's home enhancements you're describing. So, what I mean, really, you want to make your property as nice to live in as you possibly can, which means you'd be prioritising space. But we got obsessed in the 80s with value. So instead, you come around and, and, and I say, well, how much will that put on the house or, or, or a surveyor? So I'll tell you what we had in our back garden at the old house. We had an amazing timber building, right? Um, really beautiful. And, and it was fully electrified. And I did the radio show from there for... Um, for, for, for parts of lockdown and it was kitted out and it was a really nice room really and it could have been even nicer we could have got it plumbed so when we got the house valued and i asked the fellow how much is that going to put on the house i presumed because it had cost us a few grand to build it uh, he said nothing really that's what you're talking about isn't it it, that, it, it is it yeah, massively I enhanced our home i it, it mean it was a wonderful addition to our home but it didn't put anything on the value of the property it didn't go for more than next door for example that's it and people would still now, if you do this work to your house um, and say improved it size-wise, you, you would still have, when you came to sell it, it would still be a good value and good Of course, equity. of there course. There just wouldn't be as much there. As, so get say, the work done because it's going to make living there nicer, not because it's going to put theoretical cash on the house when you sell it 10, 15 years hence. Tom, thank you. Lovely part of the world where you are. No shortage of space in, in, in one sense, but of course also there'll be small properties, as you say, small dwellings and, and problems with poverty. 11.57 is the time. Karen is in Kingston with what will probably be the last word on this. Karen, what's it going to be? <laughs> Hi, basically, Hello. I think. My, my background, retired solicitor, worked for Citizens Advice as volunteer for oh, 15 yeah. years and also got interested in housing as a student in terrible accommodation. So yes. the rental sector has deliberately in my view being left insecure very expensive why, why deliberately um, in your view because i think there's huge commercial interests in pushing people to private ownership right um that's okay. why i say deliberately i mean you look at the rest of europe and as your callers have said there's no comparison and what why do we let why do we have such an insecure rental um, sector you know even if you have but firstly the conditions are often terrible and if you complain whatever any but he says you'll be evicted at the drop of a hat. There yes. are no realistic protections. So, and it's hugely expensive to move from one rental property to another. And just briefly on that, of course, rental property has been um, the tax advantages are, are on the side of major investors. If you own more than ten rental ho- um, houses under help to buy, you have huge tax advantages mm. to running it as a company. So this is all. In my view, deliberate. It's all it's weighted, very. It's all weighted. Weighted very heavily in favour of, so, of. Yeah. yeah smaller so what sections. Have you got on the other side, you've got the dream of private ownership. So what they've done there is they've reduced building regulations. You end up with situations like Grenfell, and I say that without apology. Yes. And um, we have the smallest houses in Europe in a terrible, shoddy condition. I mean, the number of so new right. builds that yeah. people. Oh, there's the entire. There, there, no, you're right. There's entire internet tribes dedicated to yeah. it, isn't there, with specific developers being singled out for the appalling state of some of the properties that they've sold brand new. So you okay. remind us, of course, of the That's Tufton it. Street mantra about, oh, we need a smaller state and less regulation, yeah. which leads directly to the things that you've just described. I, I often yeah. think of Grenfell when I hear Rhys Mogg talking about less regulation. I often think, well, how, how little do you want, mate? Crikey. Yeah. How we bad would things have to be? Sorry. We have the governments that just see the public as sitting ducks to sell shoddy houses to all their schemes buy to let um you know using the builders solicitors to save money as a solicitor that makes me cry and they end up with freehold 
um, leasehold houses with freeholds being sold to offshore companies. You hear it all the time, James. This is deliberate. Of course, this is, well, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's it's not ideologically deliberate. It's just it's just the violent promotion of profiteering over every single other thing that that creates precisely the environments you describe. So it is deliberate, but but there's no, and I'm not suggesting you were citing a, a subtext or a hidden agenda. It's just what happens if you put enriching people, a small, tiny number of people, ahead of everything else when you're policy making. I'm glad and very grateful to Karen because she has spoken for almost long enough to spare me from having to point out that Michael Gove had actually been trying to improve some elements of what we have been discussing today. But he has, according to a story in the Sunday Times, which did look as if Michael Gove had contributed quite heavily to it he has been somewhat scuppered by rishi sunak who has been listening perhaps a little bit too closely to the house builders themselves james o'brien on lbc sometimes i think you don't take things as seriously as i do lawrence for example has texted you really need to talk about how sainsbury's now considers yogurts as a main in the meal deal this is the story of the century is that true that can't be true. You'll get me into trouble with Sainsbury's now. If you carry on messing around like this, I'll have to stop reading out your messages. And who will that punish? Who will that hurt? You or me? Yeah, exactly. Not me. And I've got... I hadn't thought about this. It's a bit like um, Neil Diamond being asked to sing Sweet Caroline, isn't it? But quite a lot of people... I can't just conjure a Brexit topic out of the ether. You know, Oh, do some Brexit stuff, James, you say. And I said, well, what do you mean do some Brexit stuff? It doesn't just sort of pop up. I've got to wait until something happens in the news or something genuine occurs, then we can have a conversation about it. The idea of, of me doing a Brexit. Just do a Brexit, James. I can't just do a Brexit, honestly. Some people are so thoughtless. So, so, um, I'm not going to do the, the, the hunt conversation because I, I think it's a bit self-explanatory, really. If, if you are on 100 grand a year and you're currently spending 99 grand a year, result happiness. If you're on 100 grand a year and you are suddenly required to spend 120 grand a year to sustain the standard of living that you are achieving on 99 grand a year, result misery. Any, anyone? What, what, what Dickens character am I alluding to there? Please, I've told you enough times. You should know by now. Don't look at me blankly. I've <sighs> Okay, so that was Mr. McCorber's economic theory. And, and so Hunt is appalling at talking. He's, he's not very good at humaning. Jeremy Hunt, is he? He's not very good at humaning. But he did actually have a point. You remember, of course, when he held his budget outside um, Downing Street and it looked like he looked like a, a meerkat on wheels is probably the best way I can describe it. So I sometimes am not very good at humaning. I, I've caught myself on screen on occasion and thought, who the hell's that person? And why can't he sit up? Oh, my Lord, it's me. So I, I, I sympathise up to a point with Jeremy Hunt. But what, what all he was saying was, if you if you get a... 10, 15, 20% uptick in your outgoings, it doesn't really matter what you're on. If you were living just within your means, it's going to hit you very hard. And and the threshold for childcare actually means that you don't want to go over 100 grand. I think that's joint income. Because if you go over it, you lose about 20 grand's worth of benefits immediately on childcare, on subsidised childcare. So you stay under it, you're actually technically on 120, you go over it, you're on 101, even though you're earning 101 and next door's earning 99. I'm glad I've explained that. Uh, seven minutes after 12 is the time. So what I want to do next is, is one of my favourite subjects. It really became a subject during lockdown, and I think that is no coincidence. Prior to that, you would probably have to be doing a nighttime shift on LBC to talk about conspiracy theories, UFOs, uh, people who thought that September the 11th was, a, was an inside job. People who thought the moon landings had never taken place. But we are in a curious period of history at the moment where, and, and the key words here are outwardly sensible people. Outwardly sensible people have started believing utterly, utterly insane things. Um, oh, that's nice. Tony says, Jeremy Hunt wasn't bad when he covered your show once. Do you know what, Tony? You, you're apparently dead right. I was on holiday. But crucially, having just been rude about him, I should stress that my colleagues here at LBC really liked him, actually. One of them has even been invited to Downing Street as a consequence of how well they got on, which I thought was a bit odd. But nevertheless, that, that is something that I think you can say in his favour. And not all politicians who have presented this programme on my holidays have solicited quite such a warm response from my colleagues. There are no prizes whatsoever 
for guessing which colleagues rubbed them all up the wrong way. In fact, I believe there's video evidence, isn't there, of one of them upsetting you, Keith? Yeah, or you upsetting him. It is eight minutes after 12. Uh, enough about Jeremy Hunt. What I want you to tell me about next, and it has and it has to be someone else. I, I love you very, very much, but I don't want you to ring me and tell me that you believe that the late Queen was a lizard. I want you to ring me and tell me that you can't quite believe your mum has fallen for this stuff. Because Tim Davey, the um, chairman of the BBC, director general, no less, of the BBC, is to deliver a speech today in which he warns that conspiracy theories and misinformation are leaving people unable to determine the truth. And it, I, I think he's going to use some of the speculation surrounding the Princess of Wales's disappearance from public life over the last couple of months as an example. It, I mean, it's a little odd that we still haven't had a proper investigation into how Russia and possibly other enemies used social media to heavily, heavily influence British public opinion into the into, into the Brexit vote. But of course, the people who won it have been in charge of everything ever since. So it's unlikely that we are ever now going to get a proper look at that particular rabbit. But it, 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 the idea of destabilising, it didn't really occur to me that that strange saga could be a destabilising uh, phenomenon. But when you think about it, it is because it shakes your faith in everything. If you think that the uh, uh, royal family in the United Kingdom and elements of the media would collude in some of the theories that were being punted by some outwardly quite sensible people up until Kate's statement on, on Friday evening, it does create instability. So Tim Davies' point is, is actually really important. Conspiracy theories and misinformation aren't about making people believe um, crazy stuff. They're, making, they're about making people not believe anything or think that nothing is trustworthy. So people ring this program and complain about MSM or mainstream media. And I have to occasionally pause and point out to them that I am mainstream media. This is, you know, an incredibly popular radio station that's been in existence for decades. So what do they mean? What's the alternative? It's like alternative medicine. Alternative media is not media. The problem we've got in this country is that newspapers don't realise how bent they are. So a bloke called Trevor Kavanagh still writes a column for The Sun. He's complaining today about trolls doing bad stuff on, uh, on the internet. And he was in the office and indeed contributed to that infamous Hillsborough front page that Kelvin, the disgraced former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, um, uh, presided over that essentially maligned the grieving families of the people killed and indeed maligned the dead football fans killed at Hillsborough. So Ka Kavanaugh, and it isn't necessarily a criticism, he can't see that they are a huge part of the problem. The, the landscape in which the British public could be persuaded to believe crazy things was created by Rupert Murdoch and the Daily Mail and their cronies. They even persuaded people that the European Union was an enemy of their interests. It's, it's madness to think that you can separate one from the other. But the, but the, the nature of the post-pandemic conspiracies is different. This is people who can be persuaded that plans to create communities where everything is within a 15-minute walk are bad or at some form of effort at population control. They're trying to make us all into sheep by ensuring that the doctor's is less than 15 minutes walk away or you don't have to drive your car to get to, get to the shop. Do you see what I mean? The stuff that people are believing now is... Well, it's off the charts. But what I'm interested in, the people believing it who you can't believe believe it. Does that work? You see what I mean? You can't. But So a friend of mine stopped me, literally, in the street, not this weekend, the weekend before, because he'd been at a party the night before with someone he's known for 20, 20 years, I think. And she's gone. She's gone completely. And he works on sports media. And he said to her, look, look you know, these are my friends. It's literally the newsroom is next to the sports desk. And, and these are my friends. I promise you that they're not deliberately telling you lies about the World Economic Forum or 15 Minute Cities or what it might be. And, and she didn't know quite how to process it. But it, she sort of ended up saying, well, you probably don't know about it because you're on sport. As if the people that you sit next to at work all day are, are, are embarked upon a mission to persuade the public of complete and utter nonsense and you're sitting next to them and you don't notice. So your mum, for example, I always found it interesting during lockdown when older 
relatives because you think of it as a young person's game for some reason. I think of conspiracies as a young person's game. Um, this speech that Tim Davies giving today will ramp up the BBC's impartial news and verification techniques because challenging the digital forces that threaten democracy is, well, I'd say it was a matter of national importance. But to prove the scale of the problem, I mean, one thinks back to that Mother's Day photograph as well that had been photoshopped a little bit, but the speculation became so wild and so violent that they felt the need, even though she was dealing with a cancer diagnosis, they felt the need to put out the um, uh, explanation. People, newspapers photographing and circling. The whole world has now reached a point where you think anything might be a lie. Anything might be a... Do you see what I mean? You might as well. You probably don't think of yourself as part of this story. But I wonder whether the Princess of Wales episode did actually breach your defences a bit. You did find yourself thinking, well, that doesn't look like her. Or why did they um, manipulate that photograph? Or what, what, what? So in fact, I wonder whether the problem is much bigger even than we realise. So we can sit here in a slightly smug way, thinking about your Auntie Doris's Facebook page, trying to persuade you that 5G phone masks are going to give you measles. But I wonder whether we've all had our objectivity diluted slightly by the epic and endless bombardment of qu quotes challenges end quotes to journalism to traditional reporting that might be a conversation we can move into but let's begin with this let's begin with the person in your life who you would never in a million years have believed could fall for this stuff right? Whether it's population control, new world order, great replacement theory, the queen being a late queen being a lizard, whatever it is, vaccines being uh, uh, designed to hurt us rather than help us. The person in your life you can't quite believe has gone down these rabbit holes. 0345 60973. And what we know or what you think about how they ended up there. Okay. And as Donald Trump reaches the deadline when he's got to find 460 million quid in order to meet some of his um, legal responsibilities, Joe Biden has taken to Twitter to own him in the most magnificent manner imaginable. I shall share some details of that with you shortly. But before that, I want you to tell me about the person in your life who has fallen down a rabbit hole whether it's a vaccine rabbit hole, whether it's a World Economic Forum, 15-minute cities, low-traffic neighbourhoods, the, the, the idea that things are being done to us f dishonestly, they're not telling us the truth about things, and you can't believe that it's happened to them, all right? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And, and I don't always use a woman as an example. I sometimes talk about your Uncle Keith's Facebook page, Julie. And I suppose we'll stop saying Auntie Doris because Doris rang in and, and got quite upset with me. So you know what I'm talking about. The, the, you would have thought that the kind of person who fell for this stuff, and actually the more I think about it, the more important the Princess of Wales experience is to this whole story. You'd have thought they spent their whole life online, their whole life in their mum's spare bedroom on a, on a borrowed laptop. You're talking about people who were a little bit eccentric or a little bit out there, a little bit weird. But now, as my friend discovered last weekend... People who you really thought would know better have also started falling for stuff that is demonstrably daft. Who are they? And how has this happened? 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 21 minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, so let, let me give me a, a moment longer. I'll be with Pietro imminently. And there's still room for you to join this conversation. There's a difference between news management and misinformation. So news management will be uh, a, either an attempt to keep a story out of the news. Uh, and there are people who make an awful lot of money in that world. They're uh, brilliant at what they do. You, you, you can use some legal measures to do it, some legal levers, or you can hire a, a, someone who's owed favours, who can phone up uh, and try and persuade editors to keep a story out of the news. There's news that news management is as old as news itself. But misinformation is different misinformation is things that are demonstrably untrue being put into the public space now that's never really going to be done by the subjects of the story 
it's 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 highly unlikely. So when we spoke to the um, I, I, I can't temper Mariana Spring, who's written a wonderful book about all of this stuff, the grimmest example she had come across was a bloke who claimed that the Manchester Arena bombing wasn't real, and that families grieving and mourning were somehow actors or faking it. Alex Jones, on whose program Nigel Farage has appeared at least six times. Uh, he claimed, of course, that the Sandy Hook massacre. So, you, I mean, you live in a country where Nigel Farage now has his own television station. And 10 minutes ago, he was in bed with a bloke who claims that the Sandy Hook massacres were a hoax. So the line between misinformation and news, it, it, it's never been more blurred. It's not hard to get a grip on this. If, if someone hangs out with someone who claims that a genuine massacre or a terror attack was a hoax, then you just push them out of the public space. But... I, it seems I'm the only one that can see that so clearly. So I'm not talking about... So sadly, Kensington Palace managed the news over the last few weeks very badly. Other people would have done it better. That's not the same as, as putting out misinformation and fake stuff and whatever you want to describe it as. So I'm talking about people who believe stuff that is bonkers. That's the word I've been looking for. Bonkers. People who believe stuff that is bonkers, who on paper you really wouldn't have expected to go there. All right. Pietro is in Edinburgh. Pietro, what made you pick up the phone? Hi. Um, well, I have a, a, I'd say, extended family member that, uh, uh, using your words, went bonkers. Yes. <laughs> what happened? Um, <laughs> my, uh, 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 my dad and uh, mum split up when I was quite young. Right. And then when my dad found another partner, uh, he started going out with this lady who has a PhD in architecture. They work together. I mean, okay. she's what, what I'm trying to say is that she's uh, pretty seriously Hi, educated. Highly educated. Is, I, I mean, yeah. you're like me, I think. We're both conscious of not wanting to sound judgmental or snobbish, but you're talking about people who, who should have critical thinking skills, who understand yeah. the relationship between actions and consequences and the importance of evidence, and yet, dot, dot, dot. Exactly. That's exactly what I mean. And when COVID hit and the vaccines uh, came out as a potential solution, um, from virtually from one day to the next, I became aware that she became one of the heads of the anti-vax movement in Italy Good and Lord. was essentially leading and organizing marches. And then, uh, on the back of not wanting to uh, break uh, the, the relationship that we had uh, all together, yes. we went to see her. Um, for lunch one day because they live in the countryside and, and her new partner is a farmer. Right. And uh, uh, he started talking about how the government uh, produces storms and, uh, you know, all sorts of... Is that chemtrails? Like is, is that chemtrails? Is that producing storms? Uh, it's hard to I, keep I don't up. know. I, honestly, I don't know. But no. what he was saying was that the government was releasing substances in the air to produce giant clouds to kill his crops. Right. Um, and, and, and well, I mean, I don't feel good saying that they kind of found each other, but they kind of did. Well, they would have done. I mean, they gravitated towards each other. What, what, and you, because she was in your life for so long, you've maintained contact with her even after her and your dad split up. Yeah. And up, we sort of said, point. uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we had a, we had a very brief conversation about this whole thing saying, look, we clearly see the world in different ways when it comes to uh, vaccines and giant clouds, but, uh, uh, what happened? What, what, I mean, starting with, do you know what happened with the vaccines? Do you know how, where? Because I mean, it seems to happen so quickly. The 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 adoption yeah. of these beliefs. My, for me, it was a bloke who messaged me right at the beginning, and he'd been sent some footage of someone breaking into a five G mast site, and the footage mm. showed nothing except a bloke committing <laughs> criminal vandalism. But my mate said, I, and I hadn't seen him for 30 years, Pietro. We were at school together when we were kids. He said, you're the only person I know in the media. And I keep getting sent this. Is there anything in it? As in, are 5G masks call, causing COVID? And I thought, yeah. crikey, because it's, it's what it, 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 it can get under anybody's skin if they're not careful or, or trained. What Do you know what it was with her? Do you know where, how it started, where it went? Well, uh, I, I, no, I don't know. No. But I can. I, I have some idea of what the essence of her feeling leading to these thoughts is. Yes. And I think, in essence, her and her new partner feel like they've been lied to. Yes. And they feel betrayed by a number of uh, entities, those entities being the news and the government and all yeah. of this. That seems to be the instigating factor, which then translates into, well... If they'd lied to us before, then how can we trust anything that they say? Therefore, how is it impossible to consider that there are 
uh, poisons in uh, vaccines or uh, crazy substances in the sky. Um, it um, seems to me also a byproduct of the fact that lies like this and misinformation spread so much quicker than the truth. I read a research paper that says that it's around 70% faster. Uh, I can probably try and find it and send you a link if you need it. Uh, but well, I, it's, it's just, it's, to coin a phrase, it's sexier, isn't it? Believing this stuff is a lot more, I mean, it's, I used to have a catchphrase that it's a lot easier to sell tickets to the ghost train than it is to the speak your weight machine. Now, I was talking about politics and immigration, but it actually holds here. You get sent something yeah. telling you that that 5G mask at the end of your road is causing COVID. It's a heck of a lot more interesting than a, than a, than a textbook explanation of what a coronavirus is and, and, um, and how they develop, which most of us wouldn't even understand anyway. Agreed. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make one more point. if you Yes, of course. Time. Carry on. The, um, I, I, there's a part of me that thinks, or, well, I think it's reasonable to assume uh, to some extent that conspiracy theories have always existed uh, yes, since the dawn of, of time. Course. And, but then it seems to me like with uh, 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 much heavier marketing and advertising going into uh, environments that previously perhaps didn't have it, yeah. such as politics from the 50s and 60s up until now, um, people have grown a lot more accustomed to um, recognizing sales as opposed to leadership, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do. Uh, and that makes and it plausible that foreign, aid, foreign, foreign countries are involved in this because it destabilizes the public's relationship with government and democracy itself. Precisely. Wow. And, and I've just been reminded, and I do this for a living, that, of course, you've got Trevor Kavanaugh writing in The Sun today about how awful it all is without mentioning that Rupert Murdoch's Fox News got fined, I think, was it $787 million for spreading election misinformation? So, you know, how, how the hell can the best... I don't think it is the best-selling newspaper in the world anymore, in the country anymore, but how the hell can they be complaining about trolls when their owner was, was done for literally spreading lies about uh, counting? That's usually the phrase we use. It's not an opinion, it's counting. Cross, and that of course means that the people dedicated to the destruction or the undermining of the BBC, and remember, they're my rival. They're my only rival, the BBC. When I'm on air between ten and one, no one, no one else comes close. The BBC is the rival. They're various stations. They are my only rival. But my God, we would be worse off without them. And and of course, Rupert Murdoch fined hundreds of millions of dollars, his company Fox News, for spreading complete complete garbage about the last American presidential election dedicated to the destruction of the BBC. And he's got most Tories signed up with him. So it's a bit rich, actually, for, for government people or, or indeed some elements of our media to complain about trolls and misinformation online. And certainly, without mentioning the role that it almost certainly played in Brexit. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.34 is the time. So the more I think about it, and I've only just started thinking about it, the more significant I think this is. So there's a columnist in The Sun, he used to be the political editor, his name is Trevor Kavanagh, who was not only instrumental in that disgusting front page that maligned the 97 victims, although there weren't 97 at the time, victims of the Hillsborough disaster, and printed a farrago of lies. Um, he also, of course, still works for Rupert Murdoch, who, just to clarify, it wasn't a fine, was it? It was a settlement with Dominion Voting Systems of, of about $787 million um, in order to avoid a trial, which would have exposed how the network promoted lies about the 2020 presidential election. So this bloke not only contributed to the disgraced Kelvin McKenzie's disgusting Hillsborough front page. He also still works for a fellow who runs the company that paid $800 million to avoid a trial in which their role in promoting blatant lies about the 2020 presidential election in America would have been exposed. And I've seen some of the depositions. They're publicly available. It is absolutely extraordinary what was going on behind the scenes. Um, displaying how clear and how absolutely certain it was that these people knew exactly what they were doing, even as, for commercial reasons, they inflated Donald Trump's lies. In fact, at one point, Rupert Murdoch is asked, I think the phrase was, it's nothing to do with red or blue, is it? Which refers to Democrats and Republicans. It's all about green, which refers to the colour of dollar bills. And he, he responded, yes. So you've got a bloke called Trevor Kavanaugh 
in a once powerful newspaper, contributing not only to the single most disgusting example of journalistic malfeasance that you will see in your life, but also still working for the bloke, find eight hundred million dollars. Uh, for or if not fine, sorry, settling for eight hundred million dollars to avoid the trial at which the full scale of the way in which his network Fox News promoted lies about the twenty twenty presidential election, and he is complaining today about people in this country, the left wing Guardian, um, uh, uh, questioning the provenance of some of the photographs of of Kate Middleton of of the Princess of Wales that were published last week or the week before. Absolutely extraordinary. So he writes, trolls are polluting our national identity while still cashing paychecks from the bloke who owns the company that was fined $800 million. So I'm not suggesting that this is making me more sympathetic to conspiracy theorists, but this man thinks he's on the side, this man thinks he's on the side of the right, of the good. Here he is, uh, a, a tool of Rupert Murdoch, the man who paid $800 million to avoid a court hearing the full scale of how his company was promoting lies about the election, claiming that The Guardian, for asking, do you believe this is Kate Middleton, is somehow polluting our national identity? And, of course, inevitably in this whole column, no mention of Hillsborough as being the finest and most grim example we will ever see of the damage that morally bankrupt journalists can do to decent people. That's not very helpful for the conversation that we're having at the moment, because that almost says, well, you can't blame people now for believing it. So the, the genuine organs of news, in this case, Fox News in America and The Sun in the United Kingdom, special prize for anyone who can tell me what those two organs have got in common, Fox News in America and The Sun in the United Kingdom, routinely peddle absolute lies with borderline impunity. Hillsborough... They only really got hit for decades after the event. And the Fox News Dominion voting system story only really came about because the voting system company had the financial wherewithal to take on Fox News. And yet he thinks he gets to write a column about how bad it is that people tell lies or even just ask unhelpful questions. So that's part of the reason why things are so mad. So next time we do this, maybe I'll phrase the question slightly differently. Today, the question remains, tell me about the sensible person you know who has ended up believing bonkers things. Verity is in Brighton. Verity, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you doing? I'm very well. What's on your mind? Yeah, good. Um, I, well, so in my early 20s, I belonged to a um, religious group, uh, quite a kind of hard-lined Christian group, I guess, um, and I was having doubts. Uh, I was kind of uh, just feeling a bit disillusioned with it all. Yeah. And I took a friend of mine to the church, and he was shocked by it. So he said, why don't you come to my church? I went to his church, and I encountered something quite amazing there. Um, the vicar of his church was uh, an extremely kind person. And I'd say he was maybe what you'd characterize as a kind of a humanist Anglican. Okay. Um, his, I remember his sermon. It just shocked me so much because he opened his sermon with... Let's suppose that there is a God, <laughs> you know, okay. and that would have been yeah, that would make you absolutely. Sit up and take notice. But but you know, he was he was very philosophical. I, I went to his church for quite a while, and he was very open-minded, extremely um, encouraging of inquiry. Just as, a, as, was, a, as, a, as a brief counter, quite a lot of people are suggesting yeah. that religion would be a good starting point for conspiracy yeah, theories in uh, general. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. I, I know that's not where you're well, going. I just forgot well, to mention that no, earlier. In, in a sense, in a sense, it does go there, I go guess, um, because. Uh, I, so I went there for a while until I, I just, at some point, I just decided I don't believe any of this uh, and kind of forgot about it all. But, yeah. you know, I always held him in my memory as one of the, the more rational ends of this, you know, and extremely well-read, intelligent. Sure. And it was at a university church, you know, he was a campus minister. Um Anyway, I reconnected with him a while ago, just uh, out of fondness, really. I, I found him on yeah. Facebook and it's unbelievable i mean i you know living in brighton you encounter you pretty much have to believe at least one conspiracy theory in order to qualify to live in brighton <laughs> um i mean i just walked past a chemtrail sticker about two minutes ago did you really um, is that the but, idea but, that the stuff that we see in the sky is changing the weather yeah yeah that kind of thing okay. um but yeah he's just sharing this kind of 
by the news articles all over the place about um, a, a global uh, Marxist agenda. Um, and I, I scrolled back through his Facebook, and it seemed to start with trans issues. Right. Um, at which he was, I mean, he was... Uh, how, how is that a conspiracy theory? Well, I, get, I you know, I, I think it's it's a gateway into it in a certain sense um but it's uh, I, I guess it's the conspiracy that that there are people who kind of want to make children trans that that people want to so children kind of are being sort of forced into it or, or coerced, coerced, coerced yeah, into yeah, it. yeah and then that opens up but i mean now it's it's the this idea that, that we're moving towards a kind of communist one world government that's one of the biggest things uh, that he seems to post about, like World Economic Forum. But really? it's, it's 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 strange how it's just everything. It's a scattergun kind well, of thing. Well, that's the one thing once, I've learned, is that once you believe yeah. one thing, you kind of buy in for all... I suppose... I don't know why that would be, really. Maybe you just get a bit bored. It'd be like having beans for tea every night. Some days yeah, you might want absolutely. some spaghetti hoops. And we had we had one conversation on Facebook where I just commented on something saying, how are you doing? And he'd obviously combed my profile and... Uh, you know, I, I yeah. guess in his eyes, you know, I've got a vote that needs to be serviced nationally, and he just went bananas at me, and I, I just had to block him. You know, I was, that's that's the end of that. But it was, well, why? If I don't know how much engagement you had, but the question that always fascinates me is 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 why are they trying to do that? So I'm not quite sure what it is that the World Economic Forum is supposed to be trying to do. But um, as far as I can tell, they're trying to move us towards a, a, a kind of what, what people believe they're trying to do is get us towards a place where nobody owns anything. Why? Um, why though? Kind of what's what's the reason for what? what system. But why? What's no, the reason I, for? I've, I've no idea. No. I mean, they, they uh, some of them, some of them really extreme. I, you know, I've actually written about this a bit. And I, I, I've been down some deep rabbit holes with it. But some of the really extreme ones believe it's something to do with uh, kind of aliens that want to impose a kind of ritualistic system. You see, I start laughing now, but that's where it started because it was David Icke that it started with, wasn't it? And that, that was, that, I mean, and some people take him a bit seriously now. I, I remember when he appeared on the Wogan show and, and uh, there's money in it. I mean, that, that much is clear, but quite... I mean, it is bizarre. I wonder whether things are going backwards or forwards. Uh, if you believe in God, this person has written it, it's an unsigned text, then you can believe in anything. I don't think that's true. Uh, for example, if you believe in God, you can't believe that the earth is flat, necessarily, because you can see that it's not. You can't prove the existence of God, but you can prove the existence of your own mind. You want to get it right down to, to basics. You're talking about Cart Descartes. All you can prove with certainty is that you are currently thinking. Everything else could be imagined. You could be a brain in a vat. That was one of his favourite examples. Cogito, you've heard it before. Possibly not in context. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. But that's all you can say with certainty. A lot of 19th century continental f philosophy was dedicated to identifying the things of which we could be certain. Um, and there's not a lot. But you can be certain that you're currently thinking. That's all you can be certain of. Everything you see, everything you hear, that could be... Imagine that could be a consequence, a creation of your own of your own mind, a creation of your own thoughts. But I don't think believing in God means that you're more susceptible to conspiracy theories. I wonder whether there's a case for arguing the opposite. Actually, Richard's in Tunbridge Wells. Richard, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Good oh. afternoon. Hello, hello. Um, I have a friend, um, lady of a certain age, who not only disbelieves. Uh, climate change, hmm. then she doesn't really believe it's real. But that's quite common. That's not just... No, 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 no. no. I can, Sorry, I can, you carry I on. I can improve on this. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, then. She is absolutely convinced that it's only in the press because, you know, all the climate scientists working at universities and such like and doing their research yes. and all this, funded by some huge shadowy cabal of multi-billionaires I... who it's in the interest of get us all to buy less petrol okay, essentially to buy less petrol but this is not a million miles away from a from a daily telegraph op-ed is it and it's not I, 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 if i'm going to use the word bonkers it's not in the context of what i can read in, in the daily telegraph or what the tufton street weirdos she are read punting the, well, out she read the daily mail for 30 years yes and she gave that up about 15 years ago Too left wing <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because she's a lovely, kind person. Oh, so she could respond to the bile in the Daily Mail in a rational way. But what she did she? She bought the Daily Mail for the crossword. Yeah, but she That's ended up reading it. Unfortunately. That's what they all say. Oh, no, no, no! Please. This no, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm teasing. Um, 
British. So what did she fill that space with? Things. Where did this Sorry? stuff? Where? What did she fill that space with? Where did this stuff come from? I, well, it's something called Flipboard on her phone, I which aggregates news stories from just all over the shop, and it feeds and you according to what you've, what you've liked in the past. But you've got yes. people, people, you know, the, yes. some prominent people come out against Net Zero. So, I mean, it's quite a big political thing at the moment to claim that it's some sort of conspiracy. I saw a clip of Lee Anderson yesterday with a lawnmower, and he said something about, he seemed, I think he was complaining that you can't get a coal-powered lawnmower anymore. So it's not, I no, mean... It's not I, uncommon. It's not, it's uncommon, not that but, fringe is what I'm saying, I suppose. No, no, the fringe part is that she believes that all these university researchers on 25 grand a year or 35 yeah, grand a year right. they're all part of, of being massive funded conspiracy. by this massive conspiracy where and then you try and point out to them, it's like well yeah. it's sort of in the interest of these multi-billion dollar oil companies about the other set of news and it's just I, she can't yeah, it's just but, and that's how because that's the that's the safeguard against feeling silly so here's look here's lots and lots of evidence yeah but i think you'll find that they're being paid to provide that so it, it you've got a perfect circularity to it then and i suppose she's even got an answer to the why of it which is they're doing it to make a lot of money but then i mean yeah you, none of this stuff stands up to scrutiny i think that's why they move around so much it's why you end up believing everything because you start asking her the questions about the uh, fossil fuel stuff about climate change and she gets into hot water or, or she gets into some sticky territory and she'll start talking about chemtrails or the World Economic Forum. So you've got to keep moving around. You've got to have a million different things. Just plates. You've got to have a million different plates spinning. Otherwise, you know, if you've only got one plate and it falls off, you're left with nothing. That's philosophy, that is. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.51 is the time. Thank you, Gary, Keith, and others for reminding me. Um, this So Donald Trump, who's got a whole heap of problems at the moment, um, of which you will learn more this week, no doubt, tweeted, It is my great honour to be at Trump International Golf Club in West Palm Beach tonight, awards night in capital letters, to receive the club championship trophy and the senior club championship trophy. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I've been winning awards left, right and centre lately. I won the James O'Brien Award for being the best radio presenter. And I won the LBC Award for being in the top 20 radio presenters on LBC. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. So, I sorry, I carry on. Donald Trump in capital letters. I won both, exclamation mark. A large and golfing talented membership. A great, in capital letters, and difficult course made the play very exciting. The qualifying and match play was amazing. A large and distinguished group will be there tonight. Very exciting. Thank you. Oh, Lord. To which Joe Biden has quote tweeted, congratulations, Donald, quite the accomplishment. And I'm here all day for that sort of snark coming from the uh, elected president. Well, I suppose Trump was an elected president of the United States once and might be again. But we will take our pleasures where we find them in the meantime. 12.52 is the time. James is in Hartford. James, back to back to sensible people believing in sensible things. What would you like to say? Well, I just won the James Phillips Championship. <laughs> well done. Congratulations, mate. Seriously, well done. No, you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, well, I, you say I believe in sensible things. I used to not, which was uh, why I called in, because I used to be uh, a conspiracy theorist. Um, so I thought I'd share an, an interesting inside of you. Uh, for your listeners. Yeah, please. Um, the, the the problem is that, that qui bono does exist in the world. You know, that to think yes. that the government and media are all, all such lovely, benevolent people, they would never pull the wool over your eyes. Why would why on earth would they do that? Um, you know, is is a, is is a naive position. So you do have some some have to have some sympathy with the fact that they've got their suspicions. Uh, absolutely. That being, yeah. That being said, um, unless. The person presenting you with the conspiracy theory has a very detailed inside knowledge of that theory yeah. and, and can certainly point to some suspicious events. And the problem is, is if, you, if you're outlining that and the person in front of you has no idea what you're talking about and can't, and can't unpick it, uh, or question you properly, then you go on believing what you believe. I mean, it, to, yeah. to do a nuts and bolts example of what pulled me out of, I'll give you an example, 9-11 conspiracy wow, theory. Really? I used to... Yeah, no, I used to be big into it. But one of the things that, that's interesting about that, right, that, that, I, that you could say to someone is, well, Building 7 fell at 5 in the afternoon. The media never report on it, and it looks like it fell at 3 full speed. Now, if you look at it, it does look dodgy. 
Right. However, however, if you actually take into account the building's sprinkler system failed, it was burning for seven hours, the structure of the Twin Towers had a pancake collapse written all over it because it did, only had a central column to it, and actually it's not free full speed because the lobby collapses a full six seconds before a, a, the total collapse so of what the building. Pu- what, you do- that's a good example, and I don't want to run out of time. So what pulled you out of it then? Well, someone explaining Occam's razor. They said the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And whatever your theory is, you have to actually produce the explanation of how yeah. it happened. So, i.e., a full controlled demolition of buildings takes people going in there for weeks in advance and no one's blown the whistle on it. Now, what's more plausible as an explanation? That this was a giant CIA inside job where hundreds of people have just managed to keep their mouths shut for God knows how long. Or actually, those buildings were not designed pro- uh, you know, to withstand what happened on that day. And they came down... At, they didn't come at, for down at free full speed and you're just wrong people slip through the net sorry no i, went, I, I oh, yeah, yeah it's, 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 i mean i guess i'm expecting you to come up with some hocus pocus explanation of how you got cured as it were but in fact it's it's going to be less exciting than the theory itself isn't it it's it's, it's going to be more straightforward that's why occam's razor is such a powerful weapon what um what other ones did you fall for or was it just that one um man-made climate change I was. Uh, I, I thought that was. Uh, I thought that a was hoax. a basic. But, uh, yeah, a hoax. But uh, again, one of the things you know. So, so one of the things. Quibono that like on that. Me, who, who? I mean, to turn your quibono on its head. Who? Who benefits from persuading the population that climate change is not a problem? Well, I mean, you've got green taxes. I think. You, oh, I see. I, they're I, trying to take long... our money off as under false pretenses. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Essentially, it's a, it's a giant hoax because we're going to run out of oil eventually, and so they need to change to something. So they may as well tax their way out of it to keep control of the proletariat, kind mm. of thing. Yeah, you know. So, so you know, and and you can I can present a couple, again. I could go down that rabbit hole, present a couple of things, and then present how I got I got pulled out of it. But the problem is, is if you're in an echo chamber, you know. You remember the good old days when we thought the internet was going to be this wonderful place where we had everybody coming together and sharing disparate yes. views and coming yes. to different conclusions. Well, sorry to break it to you, but it ended up turning into silos. Into, into the opposite. Well, I, there are still nice places on there, but not, um, as you say, uh, not to the uh, cure, not, not, not enough, not on a scale to address some of the problems that you've just described. Thank you. Um, congratulations as well on your award, James, as well. I'm very proud of you, just as I think we all t- joined together today in, in congratulating Donald Trump on his magnificent victory in the Donald Trump annual golf competition and Isaac from Dagenham has been in touch to say congratulations to you James um, on becoming the best radio presenter you deserve it just to be clear it was the James O'Brien award for radio presenting I believe that the Sheila Fogarty award for radio presenting was also issued this weekend and and, and I'm delighted to to be joined on on air by the winner yeah I did win it yes congratulations well done again Again. You're like the Anton Deck of, of the <laughs> Sheila Fogarty Radio yeah. Presenting Award. No plans to retire. Um, last word on this, and it'll have to be brief, goes to Josh in Chiswick. Josh, what's it going to be? Um, so, James, very briefly, um, just following up on the climate change thing, I made a, I'm a documentary producer. I made a series on conspiracies about 10 years ago, which was slightly before things started getting... Yes. In- incredibly insane with uh, conspiracy <laughs> theories. Uh, but what, what, what I find really interesting, and this is where I get a little bit, I mean, you know, hyper-normalization and destabilization of state actors or, yeah. or whoever, you know, feeds into this. But, but this is where I get a bit tin for a hassy. But if you are minded to be a sort of Tufton Street free marketeer, if you peddle conspiracies about sort of globalist elites oh, and, right. and everything else, going around then when regulations or ltns or 50 oh, million cities or whatever are purported then you end up going look see, well, you, it's, i mean it's genius control. it's genius psychology isn't it so you you yeah. want regulations and protections to be removed so that your secret sponsors can get even richer and so you persuade people that the regulations and protections are actually to their detriment it actually yes. does them harm i'm thinking of brexit already persuading well, it, people to act against their own interests because it will enrich a tiny number of other people but they're the ones that are controlling the the, the the news flow as it were exactly the only problem is i am aware that that also makes me sound like a conspiracy no it doesn't no it doesn't no it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't well at least not to me I, 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 although what do i know I, you explained it really well i did warn you you'd have to be brief and you were and that is it from me for another day you can catch up with all of the program in all of the usual ways by going on to the global player uh, our official lbc app where you can also pause and rewind live radio download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com coming up at four tom sorbrick's in the house but now it is the 
the award-winning Sheila Fogarty. <laughs> Thank you. It is true, you know. I know. Well done. <laughs> Even without our Proud pretend awards. James O'Brien on LBC.